Distribution of Guests. The Honourable Premier. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Good morning, and thank you for your uh, ruling and your uh, wisdom and time it takes to make such rulings. Thank you very much. I want to begin by welcoming my colleagues back to the PEI Legislature for Friday debate. All of those who are tuned in at home and those who are joined in the public gallery, welcome and I hope you enjoy today's proceedings. Uh, let me begin, uh, Madam Speaker, by recognizing the tremendous uh, uh, winning record that is the Charlottetown Rural Raiders uh, uh, girls basketball team, uh, AAA champions for the ninth consecutive year. Uh, a tremendous run. That is a high school that has become a feeder school for Atlantic University and other universities beyond. Uh, it's amazing what they've built there and that uh, tradition of success continues. So congratulations to all involved there. Uh, Colonel Gray uh, was the winners of the silver medal. And of course, uh, my hometown Bluefield, Bob Katz, uh, took home the bronze. So to all who participated in all of the PEI school basketball events uh, recently, uh, Keep up the good work, and congratulations to those who were successful. I wanted to offer my thanks and big uh, congratulations also to uh, Mayor Steve Ogden of the town of Stratford and M uh, MP for Cardigan and Federal Agriculture Minister Lawrence McCauley, who made a very important announcement yesterday in Stratford, uh, $5 million uh, for 180 new homes over the next three years and a path toward 2,000 homes over the next decade. Uh, Any time we can have uh, organizations, governments, municipal, federal, provincial, uh, NGOs, uh, the private sector, anyone who can play a role in helping us address the housing challenge in this province, uh, I'm proud of and I will work with. So to Mayor Ogden and the Council in Stratford, to MP Lawrence McCauley, thanks for that wonderful announcement. It is a big weekend also for... Hockey PEI as the provincial championships begin this weekend. They'll, some will continue next weekend, but the rinks will be busy from Tignish uh, to Surrey and all points in between uh, as the uh, hockey PEI championships begin to be rolled out. Uh, that part of my life as a parent and a hockey parent seems to be behind us as uh, uh, my son Cal's team didn't qualify for the finals this year. Uh, so it'll be the first time in a very long time I, I won't be uh, out there rooting uh, for the for the North River uh, Flames, but I'll cheer for all the Flames teams who are there and also uh, do my best to get out around the rinks like I always do uh, to enjoy great hockey. So the best of luck to organizers and thanks for doing that because uh, it makes so many people uh, uh, very happy, brings a lot of joy to our province. And just finally, of course, as we look towards Sunday, uh, Madam Speaker, and uh, the celebration uh, that is St. Patrick's Day, uh, it'll be a fun day to be around uh, the establishments uh, and celebrating the great Irish tradition that is so important here uh, to Prince Edward Island and uh, a lot of fun. And every time I think of a St. Patrick's Day, I can't help but think of my good friend, uh, the late Urban Carmichael, who was a real island gem. And he's been gone a while, but he lives on because the true legends live on even long past their... They're passing, and I do recall one particular late evening at the old Dublin pub, and Urban strolled in, and he was playing his 19th or 20th gig of the day, as he often would, because he wouldn't say no to anybody. And he got up on stage as a proud Islander with very, very deep Irish roots that he couldn't be any prouder of, and he said he's beginning to think that St. Patrick's Day is like a feed of smelts, and that once a year is plenty. And uh, uh, I think of that often, and sometimes I sit here and think that I would say that many premiers have sat in this chair ever since we've gone to the two house sittings. They might say uh, one house sitting a year is plenty like a feed of smelts, too. But, but to all those who will get out and celebrate uh, uh, St. Patty's Day, do so. Uh, uh, hoist one with care. Uh, please don't drink and drive, uh, and just enjoy the best and celebrate those wonderful roots that are the Irish traditions of PEI. So thank you very much, Madam. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise today and welcome those who are watching online and those who are joining us in the gallery today, especially those joining from Holland College, the Lynx program. Uh, welcome. Um, and I, too, want to send out uh, best wishes to all teams participating in the Hockey PEI Provincial Championships that are being held on this, on this weekend. Um, good luck to all the teams. Um, and I'm going to mention again today 
because it's a very important fundraiser and TIGNISH, and that's for the purchase of a new fire truck for the TIGNISH Fire Department and MJ's Bakery, uh, all proceeds for the lobster burgers that she will sell on Monday will go towards that fundraiser. So anybody in the area, please phone in your order and uh, support the TIGNISH Fire Department. Uh, also, there's another uh, fundraiser on uh, Sunday evening, March the 17th. It's a St. Patrick uh, Day event at the Perry Centre. It starts at 7.30. It's a fun-filled night with uh, lots of laughter, lots of local entertainment and, and skits. And uh, proceeds will go towards the purchase of a new ultrasound machine at the Western Hospital in Alberton. So if you have nothing to do on Sunday evening, please drop by the Perry Centre in Tignish and support this very well um, um, a need for an ultrasound machine at the Western Hospital. Also, uh, Madam Speaker, while I'm on my feet, I too want to wish everybody uh, a very um, happy St. Patrick's uh, Day on Sunday. And again, if you're out uh, partying, party responsibly. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and good morning to my colleagues and, and uh, pages today, and everyone joining us in the gallery, uh, and those from Holland College, welcome. Um, I, we have a few birthdays today in my life. I've got, uh, I hear that there's a special birthday in this house coming up soon with that of Brian Weldon, so happiest of birthdays to Brian. Um, it is Betty McPhee's birthday, one of, our, one of our Michelle Patterson's mom, and my uncle Grant is celebrating a birthday, Grant Bernard. He's, he's always lived next door to me growing up, so we, and he never had children, so he's always been more like a second dad to me than an uncle, so happy birthday, Grant. I know you're not watching, but just in case you are. Um, I also, there's this weekend, this evening at Beaconsfield uh, House, Historic House, they're continuing their winter performance series and this evening they are featuring Julie Pelletier Lush and um, it's a fundraiser for the historic property. The costs of maintaining such a beautiful big uh, historic building are quite high and while many of us I'm sure have attended many events in the, in the carriage house, this one's actually happening in the drawing room inside the house. And so Julie will be entertaining with drumming and singing and storytelling and sharing her poetry and stories about her life and the beautiful um, Mi'kmaq culture, as well as she'll be launching a new book, uh, Mi'kmaq Ghost Stories of PEI, which I look forward to reading and what a perfect place to launch that book. Um, they'll be doing tours of Beacon Field before the performance from 6 to 6.30 and then the performance will start at 6.30. Um, and as we mentioned yesterday, uh, provincials are happening, and today, provincials are happening all across the island this weekend, so I want to wish everyone a really fun weekend. I hope that you uh, make some personal bests this weekend, and I promised my son, Hunter, that I, because I missed so many of his hockey games this winter, that I would be at every single provincial game this weekend, so my calendar, I cleared it off to make sure I could do that. And finally, Madam Speaker, I would also like to wish everyone a happy St. Patrick's Day. I hope that um, you celebrate fun, keep safety in mind, and please arrange a driver or a way to get home before choosing to get behind the wheel of the car when you shouldn't be driving. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Time Valley Sherbrooke. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Welcome to my colleagues that are here today and the ones in the gallery. Um, and also uh, welcome to those watching from District 23. And I have to say a shout out I did last year and I will again to uh, Bertha from the Honourable Member Kensington Malpex District. Um, just to note, I never forget my tie clip. And I've even convinced a couple of colleagues to, to wear one too. <laughs> uh, last evening I was very pleased to be one of the judges at the Lot 16 4-H Club public speaking competition. There was close to 30 competitors and they did make it very difficult. So I'll just say hats off to them as they all did a tremendous job. Thanks. Now, Minister of uh, Economic Development, Innovation and Trade. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, it's an honor to ride today to uh, bring greetings to uh, all Islanders watching from across this lovely province, specifically those who are, especially those watching from District 24, Evangeline Miskush. Madam Speaker, uh, I would also like to recognize a group of individuals that are very important to me and to this province, and in my opinion, uh, that we don't recognize enough. Um, in my previous world, we used to say it takes a village to raise a child, uh, and I want to say today I might invent my own saying and say it takes a team to raise successful politicians. So a special shout out to all our civil servants that work diligently behind the scenes uh, 
on our behalf to make sure that we are capable, willing, and ready to have these uh, worthwhile discussions in the legislature. So to our staff, to the uh, staff of government office, our deputies, executive assistants, comms people, CFOs, directors, and all staff members, but a special shout out to my own staff, my deputy Stephanie Corbett, comms people Vicky, Nicole, and Brooke, CFO Jed McEwen, my executive assistant Shelley Young, Brendan, who keeps me on my toes on every day, every day, and a special welcome to her as she's been joining our team uh, in the last month, and she's doing a fabulous job. So thanks to all of those people, and also to Francine Arsenault, my MA. Uh, without her, I'd be lost in the district, and she keeps me uh, in line. And a special happy birthday to to her as well, as she celebrated her 54th birthday yesterday. So finally, Madam Speaker, a special shout out as well to Kirk McKinnon and Jeff Young, uh, who uh, debate our debates uh, within their offices on a daily basis. So thank you very much, Madam Speaker. The Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Public Safety, Attorney General, and Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and happy Friday to everyone. Um, just the other day, uh, the leader of the third priority mentioned my mom, and uh, I, I, I feel obligated to, uh, to talk about my mom here today. Uh, people ask me how my mom's doing. She's 80, and she has a busier agenda than, uh, than I do, and uh, she's a very busy lady, and uh, the leader of the third priority has seen her at swimming, which she goes to at least three or four times a week. That day, she came home, and... Uh, she, she surprised our family who was going in five different directions uh, that evening when she brought us supper. So she's a wonderful lady and I just want to say hi to, uh, to my mother. And I also want to give a congratulations to the uh, winners of the Easter Beef Show. Uh, Parker Smith and Colby McQuarrie, McQuarrie, uh, McQuarrie sorry, are uh, quite a tantum, Madam Speaker. They, uh, they're, they're young guys that have uh, really uh, splashed onto the the show circuit to say in, in the uh, the beef world, and also to Spencer Hambly and his family for the reserve champion. And uh, as the leader of the opposition noted, he's that's where he first saw me at the Easter beef sale, <laughs> and uh, I will be there this afternoon, Madam Speaker. So I haven't seen the member there since I've met him uh, many years ago, and since I've been the Minister of Agriculture but I encourage him to bid fast and bid often today. So thank you, Madam. The Honourable Member from Gordon Ducora. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and good morning, everybody uh, in the chamber and in the gallery and watching maybe at home uh, from District 19. Um, similar to uh, the member from Tyne Valley, Sherbrooke, I also had the opportunity last evening to serve as a uh, judge of the uh, communications event put on in Kinkora by the Freetown Harmony 4-H Club. Uh, my first time uh, serving in that capacity as a judge, and I have to tell you, I was quite impressed uh, with the quality of the young people. There was uh, probably close to 20 between the ages of 8 and 17 uh, that took to the floor to deliver prepared remarks. And uh, I can tell you that um, the future is bright uh, for the area with the quality that I saw, with the presentations and the preparations last evening. and. Um, it was a wonderful event put on, and I uh, just wish to uh, thank the organizers for the opportunity to, to attend, and uh, very impressive. Thank you. Gentleman from Charlottetown, West Royalty. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Just a great pleasure to rise and say hello to everybody watching from uh, Charlottetown, West Royalty, and uh, you know, congratulations to all basketball teams. Um, I did mention that earlier this week, but also the coaching, uh, all the coaches who coach in, uh, in junior high and and high, high school are all volunteers, so they put in a, a, mm -hmm. an amazing amount of time. So congratulations to them um, on successful seasons. I want to say hello to Sarah Fuller, and, and thank you for taking an interest in, in, in these proceedings and uh, coming down to watch today, uh, and I hope you enjoy. And also the Lynx program, which is language instruction for newcomers to Canada. And Leanne and, and everybody here, hello. It was a great pleasure to speak with you before, and oftentimes, I don't even understand the language in here and uh, at the best of times. So um, anyway, I'd like to welcome you here and enjoy the, the democracy at its finest. Thank you. Rocky Point. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Speaker. I'd like to also welcome everybody to the House on the final day of our third week uh, in this sitting, and to everybody in the gallery today and those watching at home. Uh, I, I'm rising 
this morning, Madam Speaker, on the cusp of St. Patrick's Day to say hello to my daughter, Kate, who lives now in Montreal. She's been there for 10 years. And she teaches in the department at the Concordia University in the Department of Irish Studies. And her main topic, she did her PhD on fiddling on PEI and the influence of the Irish uh, folks, Scottish, Acadian, and others on island fiddling, which is a very unique thing and actually differs from county to county. And so she's very much enamored with, uh, although she doesn't actually have Irish roots herself, Scottish ones, of course, but no Irish ones. Um, she teaches in the, in the Irish studies department, as I said, and for those that occasionally go up to Montreal for a Habs game, um, sometimes they'll go into Hurley's pub, either before or afterwards, for a, a pint of Guinness, or it's not far from the Bell Centre, and you'll find Kate playing there on a regular basis uh, in Hurley's pub. It's always packed, and they have great live music in there. And uh, I just want to say hi to Kate, um, a wonderful daughter, and I miss her like crazy. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today. I'd just like to welcome everybody to the gallery, my colleagues, everybody in the gallery that are here watching and everybody watching from across the island, especially the greatest district, District 19. Uh, special shout out to my faithful watchers, uh, uh, Carrie who's at work and Elizabeth and Joan and Kathy, they watch every day. But uh, as we're into the Ides of March, Madam Speaker, I'd just like to put a reminder out there to the harness racing community. Today's the deadline to lighten your pocketbook as stake payments are due today and a lot of members in my district realize that and, uh, but also I spoke to it on the first of the week about the playoffs the provincials and uh, although I won't be up in Tignish today I'll be there on the weekend so I have to miss my daughter's first game up there but uh, the girls with the Summerside Inferno uh, give it all so go Inferno go. The yeah, member from Rustico Rules. Madam Speaker I wanted to wish everyone a, a happy early St. Patrick's Day Slauncha, top of the morning, and many sociables this weekend. And um, just say, I'm, I'm very proud to represent Shamrock, where the luckiest of people live, down in District 18, Rustico Emerald. And I also wanted to recognize Sarah Fuller in the gallery. She's an engaged islander, very passionate about the energy file, and I believe doing some property management and, and landscaping now. So um, if you have uh, some energy questions or needs, especially about efficiency, she's a good person to, uh, to run them by. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, members, since it's Friday, I'll get up and, and uh, say hello to District 4. Um, everyone watching from District 4, um, hello to the residents of the Gillis Lodge. Um, got to go there a number of times in the last couple of weeks. Um, last night we had a meeting of the Belfast Community Development Corporation. It was the biggest crowd I've ever seen at an AGM. A um, number of issues brought forward. Um, Four new board members, uh, lots of uh, talk about what needs to be done in the community. Uh, they managed the, uh, the golf course, the was a provincial park, and the pool down in Belfast, and are um, huge, huge advocates for our community and for any kind of development. So I want to thank the board members for their um, dedication. Um, for everyone who's uh, excited about the provincials, those are wonderful days. Um, <laughs> I miss them. Uh, and it's a very big void in your life once your kids get through that. And you don't realize it until it's done. But the, the family and friends that you meet, meet during hockey is probably, you know, the closest. I used to say there are people you see a lot more than you see of your own family during hockey season. So enjoy. Good luck to everyone in the provincials. And to the Honorable Minister of Agriculture, good luck this afternoon. I feel as Speaker I should have adjourned um, the House at like quarter to one so we could all go to the Easter Beef show and maybe we would, could have bid up um, some of those um, cattle to a better price. But I encourage everyone to go after uh, the House. Um, uh, congratulations to all of the winners and to everyone involved. Uh, the Honourable Member mentioned 4-H. It's, it's quite a, f a feeding ground for 4-H as far as being able to display cattle and, and show cattle. And uh, I think it's a Grand Island tradition. So I just wanted to wish everyone a great day and have a great weekend. Statements by members, beginning with the Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. One of the four top issues challenging educators in our public school system in PEI is that of classroom complexity or classroom composition. Imagine yourself in a classroom, pick your age range. There are up to 30 students sitting in front of you, each student unique in personality and makeup. 
Some come from families who are able to meet all their needs in a timely manner. There's nothing they need. Some have access to healthy food, some don't. Some are living in families with significant physical and or mental health issues. They may be living with addictions, some are not. Some students have a stable roof over their heads, some do not. Some students in your classroom have very little consistency, safety, or love in their lives, and some have an abundance. Some have diagnosis for a variety of issues, from diabetes to ADHD to autism to a learning disability to anxiety to depression. Some are in need of diagnosis and some are perfectly healthy. Some are set up for success to learn, some are not. On top of that, we have learned increasingly over the years that not all children learn in the same way or at the same pace. Because of all of these things, students have, ver have different expectations and outcomes for their education. They may be working on different things than their classmates, so they may be on an, edu an individual education plan or an IEP. I've been in classrooms where the teacher has had 10 students on IEPs. If a teacher is lucky, they will have an EA or multiple EAs assigned to their classroom, but unfortunately this is not always the case. So this is challenging for the adults in the room. Imagine what it's like for the students. It is impacting the learning and they're not necessarily having their needs met every single day. Society has changed. Naturally, the social changes we are experiencing are reflected in schools, and educator, educators are increasingly being asked to take care of many needs beyond education. I believe it is time that we start looking at other solutions, and that starts with listening to the ideas of educators. Adding more and more people into schools for support is helpful, but we need to be considering the needs of students when we are deciding who these people are. Island students need decision makers, who, to have their best interests in mind at all times and who stop doing the same things over and over again expecting different results. Our students need, need educational reform and they need it now. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you so much. Madam Speaker, in some cultures, elders are deeply respected, admired because of their very life experience and their lifetime of accumulated knowledge. But sadly, older folks are not always treated with this kind of reverence. It perplexes me when I see those who have contributed so much to our communities, spent their lives working hard, raising families, providing as volunteers the social glue that binds communities tight and strong. So many and so often they end up warehoused apart from the rest of society as they age. Wouldn't it be great if PEI became known as the center of excellence for elder care? To accomplish that, we need to be imaginative, to be caring, and to be innovative. And that's why I'm so disappointed at this government's approach to taking good care of island seniors. It is to provide money, much more money, to private LTC operators. An internal review from 2021 told us that we'd need more than 400 new beds by the end of next year. And this government is only just getting onto that now. It's also choosing to spend taxpayers' money not in a very well-established public system, but in the private sector, which has been shown time and time again to be inferior in outcomes to the public system and almost impossible to get any information out of when it comes to their financials, and to their standards of care. Is that really the best we can do? Why not aggressively expand home care supports, including finally standing up that primary caregiver grant program we've been promised for so long, and to develop alternative living arrangements like smaller co-housing units and supported living arrangements where dignity and independence are prioritized and are nurtured? Our elders deserve the best and most dignified care that we can possibly provide, not the most convenient and careless choice for a tired and uninspired government. LTC, after all, does not stand for least thoughtful choice. Although this government, that seems to be their go-to way of scrambling to poorly address an issue that they should have tackled many years ago. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honourable members, I'll just point out that uh, member statements are to be 90 seconds or less. Uh, that's why they're called 90 seconders. So just a reminder. 
Questions by members, beginning with responses to questions taken as notice. Uh, the Honorable Minister of Housing, Land, and Communities. Uh, Madam Speaker, in response to a question from the um, Leader of the Opposition uh, yesterday around uh, some data uh, uh, about acquisitions by the PEI Housing Corporation, I'll be tabling uh, that data later on uh, during tabling of documents. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So back in November, on multiple occasions, I asked the Minister of Housing regarding the government's purchase of 140 housing units from the, from the private market. So despite uh, repeated inquiries, months have passed without any substantive response from the Minister. Now, he just mentioned today that he has something to table. I don't know what that is, but we'll have to wait and see. So even this week, as I pressed for answers, all I received was hesitation from the Minister. Yet yesterday, we learned of plans to acquire another 100 properties. So surely the Minister can break his pattern of evasion and provide the opposition with some much-needed answers today. So the Minister of Housing, you've agreed to table something today. Does that include a list of pro uh, purchased properties, their appraisals, and purchase prices? Minister of Housing, Land, and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, yes, it does. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Now I look forward to receiving that information. Yesterday, the Minister casually mentioned plans to purchase an additional 100 units within the next two to three weeks. Yet there remains a lack of clarity regarding the process of identifying these properties for public housing. The Minister seems to think that by refusing to provide this House with essential information about how the purchase of these homes occurs and what type of process his government follows when purchasing these homes in question, he is sticking it to, uh, to us, to the opposition, when in reality all he is doing is showing honours once again that he's just not up to the job. So Madam Speaker, to the same Minister, does the government wait for homes to be listed or do they proactively approach homeowners? Minister, please enlighten us on this, the procedures involved. The Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, the PEI Housing Corporation uh, both tenders uh, for construction of new uh, housing units and we acquire housing units that are for sale on the market. And those go to our inventory of social housing, which creates aff deeply affordable housing for, for islanders in need of, of affordable housing. Um, today, I'll be, as I said, I'll be tabling data about um, uh, purchases that have been made by the Housing Corporation, and indeed, uh, I'd be happy to uh, table more information about uh, properties that the Corporation acquires as those purchases are made and as the deals close. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, but I also heard the same thing last fall, so I have yet to see that actually uh, turn out to be a, a paper that was tabled. So, Madam Speaker, despite my persistent inquiries, inquiries yesterday, the Minister seemed to, uh, pretty hesitant to provide straightforward answers. So, either this Minister is fine to keep Islanders in the dark about how he and his department is using tens of millions of dollars, or he doesn't actually know the file, and is therefore unable to answer simple questions about the process. So, let's revisit those questions and give the Minister one more chance to redeem himself in the eyes of Islanders and his Cabinet peers. Minister, what is the budget allocated for, the, for acquiring the latest 100 units that you announced your department would be purchasing in the next few weeks. The Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, I'm proud of this government's investment in um, uh, purchasing affordable housing for our social housing inventory. Over the past uh, uh, five years, we've uh, spent about $100 million to add to our inventory of social housing. Members aware because we've uh, uh, passed our capital budget, we intend to spend another sixty million dollars and uh, and continue to do that uh, for years ahead to uh, to deal with our, our our housing crisis here in Prince Edward Island. And in fact, there has in the history of Prince Edward Island, there has never been more subsidized housing in this province to make create affordable housing for Islanders in need. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. But try selling that to the islanders who do not have a home. Yeah. Madam Speaker, one possible reason this minister seems so uncomfortable answering these questions is because he's making this all up as he goes along. It's not just a couple of homes, Madam Speaker. By the minister's own count, it would seem that there are more than 200 units that have been purchased, and yet crickets when it comes to the details. Question to the Minister of Housing. 
as it pertains to the most recent 100 units that your government expects to purchase in the coming weeks, will you table the rationale, including the evaluation process that concluded that these specific units and homes were acceptable for the purchase by Islanders? The Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I can assure you that my staff uh, is very diligent about purchasing properties that are in good repair and will make excellent homes for people of Prince Edward Island that require them. Uh, you know, this government and every government before us uh, dealt with housing only through the PEI Housing Corporation. Not only are we continuing that work to put low-income islanders in affordable housing, but like never before, we're working across the entire housing uh, continuum to provide uh, working with other levels of government, with the private sector, with nonprofit sector, to uh, lift the entire sector, uh, housing sector in Prince Edward Island and create pathways for ownership for first time home buyers through programs like our down payment assistant program, our rent own program, our closing cost program. We'll continue to do the hard work to make housing more affordable. Well, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And I do agree that your staff works hard to help Islanders with housing. But my question was, was would he table that information? So I'm going to ask him again. Will you table the rationale, including the evaluation process, that concluded that these specific units and homes were acceptable to be purchased by Islanders? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I'm not involved in the actual acquisition of properties, but I'll go back to my staff and see what we have in terms of policy and how we, uh, how we select properties. I know that in terms of the physical location of properties, it's based on uh, the registry of people who are qualified to be in social housing or not yet in social housing, and we do that based on the need in specific areas of the province. So what, whatever we have, uh, I'm happy to provide to the, to the, uh, to the member. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. The Minister seems very concerned about privacy, but I'm not sure exactly whose privacy he's concerned for. Not once have I asked for a list of tenants of these homes. Not once has anyone asked for Google Street view images. We simply want to know the basic information. And it should not be a privacy issue telling Islanders where their taxpayer-owned houses are located. He said they were from tip to tip. I want to know if my community is also including this, Madam Speaker. So question to the Question to the minister. Question to the minister. The member has the floor. So, question to the minister. I want to know where are these soon to be 100 units located? How many are located in various communities mentioned yesterday? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And <clears throat> although I, I, I do have privacy concerns, and uh, in fact, that's why we have a privacy commissioner to manage uh, what data goes public and to look after the privacy concerns of the people of Prince Edward Island. So uh, I, I have here the data that the, the honorable member is looking for. And as I said earlier, I'll be happy to provide information about the properties we acquire in the future. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. The thing is, I've been asking for months and months and months, and he keeps uh, for somehow evading it. So the minister is failing, or I should say flailing, in an effort to share as little information as possible about these home purchases. And it's for the, for the life of me, Madam Speaker, I can't figure out why. It's not clear to me why this Minister of Housing seems to be so uncomfortable to be fielding questions about housing transactions made by his own department. But Madam Speaker, it's the minister's job to answer and to explain the actions of his department, and so far, I don't think he's living up to the job. So question to the Minister. Can you confirm if these 100 units are single-dwelling homes or multi-unit buildings? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And, and the member doesn't appear to want to take yes for an answer. Uh, I guess he wasn't expecting me to come with the, the information that he requested. But, uh, Madam Speaker, um, <clears throat> we'll continue to do the good work of acquiring properties. Uh, I'm absolutely pleased to provide this information to the, to the member opposite. Um, he asked for it yesterday. It's coming today. And as I said, uh, I hope he's pleased with uh, the quick action on behalf of my staff to provide this today. <laughs> It's not the staff in question, Madam Speaker. It's the Minister's responsibility to report back to this House. It's taxpayers' dollars. Responsible use of taxpayers' funds is non-negotiable for us, Madam Speaker, and it demands rigorous scrutiny. 
while the minister seems to think that his actions and his, uh, his, his uh, decisions should never be questioned, I'd like to remind him that his subject to the same scrutiny is that he is subject to the same scrutiny that every minister faces when dealing with public funds. If he would simply provide straight answers for once, it wouldn't look so much like he was trying to hide something, Madam Speaker. So the same minister, does the minister's department seek appraisals and inspections before purchasing properties with taxpayers' money? What levels of scrutiny is applied to these transactions? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Uh, I can assure the member that um, we are very diligent with taxpayers' money when we're purchasing properties. We go through all of the routine uh, inspections, appraisals, and everything else to make sure we're getting good value for money for the taxpayers of Prince Edward Island. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So this minister loves to boast about his uh, ability to navigate permitting processes and finding solutions, yet the recently released housing strategy for our province offered nothing more of the same, a do-nothing approach from a government that just is not up to the job. Can the minister clarify if he has engaged in discussions with commercial building owners about converting them into residential properties? Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And, um, <clears throat> I'm a little unclear about the question, but um, it's certainly a, uh, an idea that's been uh, uh, discussed publicly uh, in this day and age. We've got a lot of people working from home. We have commercial and office space that's uh, uh, in some cases unused, although I know a lot of people looking for space in, in, uh, in Charlottetown and across the island who have difficulty finding it. But we'll look for opportunities to support the uh, uh, to support housing wherever it, we might be able to find it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So, Madam Speaker, we've heard rumors that this government is uh, considering regulating commissions in the real estate industry here on Prince Edward Island, which could have on. In, Madam Speaker, this is what we've this was brought to our attention. We could have unintended consequences, or that could have un unintended consequences for those who are looking to purchase a new home. So yesterday the Minister of Housing informed us that it wasn't his mandate to oversee real estate agent commissions, and that the responsibility fell to the Minister of Justice. So question to the Minister of Justice, is your government planning to regulate real estate commissions paid on housing transactions, yes or no? Minister of Justice and Public Safety. Madam Speaker, that's the most ridiculous question I've heard here today, and I've heard a lot. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, West Royalty. Madam Speaker, in light of recent revelations, it has come to our attention that Dalhousie Faculty of Medicine presented a proposal similar to that of Memorial University aiming to establish a satellite medical school campus on our island, modeled after the successful setup in St. John, New Brunswick. This raises concern about the decision-making process surrounding the selection of Memorial University for the medical school here in Prince Edward Island. Question to the Minister of Health. Could the Minister provide clarity on whether Dalhousie indeed submitted a proposal for consideration? Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And um, again, uh, it was before my time uh, as Minister that those conversations happened. Um, I guess, um, you know, Mun and Dow represent two good opportunities, so I don't know if the member is trying to pit one against the other. Um, again, we are setting up Atlantic Dean's table to, for all the medical schools in Atlantic Canada so that they work together, so I hope he's not trying to pitch one against the other. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member from Charlton, Ms. It's, it's a surprise the minister wouldn't know this information. It's, it's, very, it's very important. Despite Dalhousie's established connection with their health care system in the Maritimes, their proposed, uh, proposal appeared to be disregarded in favor of Mun, a decision that magnitude warrants, it warrants scrutiny, particularly concerning the allocation of Islanders' taxpayers' funds. Islanders deserve to know the details around the selection process, which university also submitted proposals, and the cost of each option compared to the $129 million allocated for the UPI or Mun School of Medicine. Could the minister disclose and table all information regarding Dow's proposed satellite school here in Prince Edward Island? Minister of Health, oh, sorry, the uh, Honourable Premier. Uh, I would just like to clarify some facts here because it's quite obvious the opposition is short on them. Um, the University of Prince Edward Island partnered with Memorial University uh, on a joint 
co-degree program, uh, the first of its kind in Canada. The University of Prince Edward Island came to the government of PEI and said, we are going to pursue this, can, we, can you work with us and help us implement the program, which we did. We didn't pick one over the other. We're supporting our university, who's partnered with another in the region, to train uh, medical students and train new doctors in this region for this province and for this country. That's what we're doing. I wish the honorable member would understand the process and how that has happened. I just asked a simple question. Did it happen? And where's the information? And that's not, uh, you know, to, to, to put it back on me is ridiculous. I wanted to know what PEI had and what, what we were doing. Madam Speaker, I will table an important document today for Islanders. The disclosure of a signed memorandum of understanding or an MOU between UPI and Memorial regarding the medical school raises significant transparency and accountability questions. It's troubling that the agreement was only made public after the UPI Faculty Association reached out to the Munn Faculty Association. To the same minister or to the Premier, uh, how long have you been aware of this agreement and why did it take an external intervention for this agreement to come to light? Was there an intentional effort to keep this agreement concealed from Islanders? The Honourable Premier. Uh, Madam Speaker, I have absolutely no idea what he's talking about. The government of PEI or the government of Nova Scotia or the government of any other province doesn't start a medical school. We are working with our professional institution, the University of Prince Edward Island, one of the great institutions in this country, who are working with Memorial University, who have established for decades a wonderful medical program. Uh, it's a joint degree. It's a co-partnership, uh, uh, the first of its kind in this country. This isn't anything government picking one over the other. This is one university working with another, and we're setting up our system to enable uh, UPEI to be successful, to, earn, to train more doctors in this province, for this province, because we need labor in this province. Madam Speaker. Good. Question to the Minister of Health. Do you know about this MOU? Oh, you want me to? Question to the Premier. Do you know about this MOU? I have no idea what you're talking about again, Mr. Madam Speaker. I am working with the University of Prince Edward Island. They have undertaken a diligent process to, break, uh, to partner with Memorial University, who have been training doctors in this region for decades, Madam Speaker. That is what we're working on. The university is an independent organization. Government funds the university as it should. It's one of the best in the country. I don't know why this member, in particular, has taken such a run at the University of Prince Edward Island for trying Shame. to set up a medical school Shame. in this province. It's the saddest day I've been in here, Mr. Madam Shame. Speaker. I'm pretty much done with your spit. There's $2 million in that MOU. Are, the, are, are Island taxpayers paying for that? Where is that money coming from in the MOU, Mr. Premier? Hard to believe you. Yeah. The Honourable Premier. Again, Madam Speaker, a memorandum of understanding between two universities, why would I have it? Why would I know what they're doing? I am working with the University of Prince Edward Island, who have implemented a strategy to develop a medical school. I'm working with them because I think it's a good thing. Not only me, Madam Speaker, the vast majority of Islanders think it's a good thing. They wish former governments would have done this 10 years ago. Not only does our government think it is, the federal government in Ottawa have put $20 million into the University of Prince Edward Island for a medical school. They were lined up, Madam Speaker. Minister Freeland, Minister DeClos, Minister LeBlanc, the four MPs, even the member from Charlottetown West Raleigh, we had to put extra chairs in for the Liberals, Madam Speaker. They wanted a medical school. I just simply asked if you saw it. <laughs> I mean, this, this document was signed in September. We're, we're just seeing it now. It had to come out in different channels. This has repercussions, and I want to make sure that the province is not only on board, but we're doing this the right way. <laughs> I mean, I mean, this is a lot of taxpayers' money. This is just, I don't even know what this $2 million is for. What is this $2 million in this MOU for, Mr. Premier? Slow it down. The Get on Premier. Board. Again, Madam Speaker, the University of Prince Edward Island is an independent uh, body. They work uh, with other universities to, uh, across the country. They're working now with Memorial University to set up a medical school in Prince Edward Island. 
Uh, it would be a terrible, terrible day in this world if the provincial government wouldn't assist their university to develop a medical school at a time when we're starving for doctors and they're dying to train them here, Madam Speaker. It would be a shame. I don't understand the question. I don't understand where the question's coming from or what answer the minister or the member's looking for. Madam Speaker. Our office was contacted recently, uh, Madam Speaker, by an islander who is experiencing health issues that requires them to go off-island to receive care. We have seen a massive spike in the number of off-island visits in recent years. And one area that this person experienced significant issues with was the ability of island health care providers in sharing information such as test results, radiographs, MRI scans, um, just as a, for example, with specialists in Nova Scotia. My question, Madam Speaker, is to the Minister of Health. Why do we knowingly choose an electronic health record system for Prince Edward Island uh, that is incompatible with our neighboring provinces on whom we increasingly rely for patient care? Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And it is difficult to answer that question without any more specifics. But again, do we have some interoperability interoper with our current EMR system? Uh, there isn't a national one, so uh, that is not. Uh, something that the, the country has in place, but again, that we call it interoperability. So there is steps with our provider to uh, connect with certain systems. So again, there are some that have interoperability. I talked about virtual hallway yesterday and how effective it's been. And I can certainly table the results of what uh, tomorrow on, on the virtual hallway and its successes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Borden can call your first supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The individual that I referred to who has agreed that we can share the information uh, says in their letter, and I quote, this lack of connectivity not only jeopardizes individual patients' health, it also adds strain to our health care system, resulting in additional tests, additional uh, longer wait times, complications, and extended delays for other patients, end quote. Question of the same minister. Given the stresses that our electronic health record system is placing on patients, <coughs> providers, and the health care system itself, when will the situation be resolved, and when will we see the seamless transfer of information between PEI, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick get established? Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And I guess the, the Honourable Member could also probably direct his question to the Minister of Health in Nova Scotia and uh, New Brunswick, too, as well. Again, um, we talk about interoperability and, and about standing up our EMR system. Um, we've, we were ahead of the curve um, in, in putting this in place for our physician community and PEI. We don't have control of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, but again, my uh, answer about interoperability continues to happen with providers and to connect everybody. I talked about Ontario yesterday, that they have three separate systems in the province of Ontario and it's proposing to be a big problem in that province, and they're going to have to re-spend a whole bunch of money in order to probably consolidate those three providers. So again, proud of what we've done in PEI with our EMR, and we'll continue to work with our outer province partners. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member from Borden, Thank, you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I hear the Minister acknowledge that there is interoperability problems in other provinces, and that's what we need to avoid. We need to make sure we do it right down here. Islanders deserve something a little better than the Phoenix payroll system for electronic health records in this province. The person who wrote to our office has even carried their physical records with them in case the electronic records can't make it. For many folks, this is not possible. The responsibility for sharing health records must and should fall on health PEI, not individual islanders. Earlier this week, the minister said in this house that the days of carrying hard copies are behind us. However, the reality is our electronic medical record system doesn't even communicate with some specialist labs and clinics within our own province. To the same minister, once again, this government only offers islanders better than nothing. How can you justify imposing a system that doesn't communicate Islanders' medical information when and where they need it? Minister, Health and Wellness. Thank you. And for the third time, I'll answer the question about interoperability and our ability. We don't have the ability to select vendors in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick and to tell them how to operate their health care system. Uh, again, we do work with our providers for interoperability, so I know I can't, uh, again, if specific specialties and stuff, I could probably comment a little bit better or bring some information back to the Honourable Member. But again, it's something that we continue to work on. We're modernizing our health system with EMR. It's part of our federal funding agreement, as well as that we modernize our system and, and have more access to data. We are doing that, making those investments. And again, they are, uh, it increases patient care and PEI, and we'll continue to do that, Madam Speaker. 
The Honourable Member from New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. Back in 2019, a constituent of mine was attacked by a dog while, while he was riding his bicycle. He was seriously injured, breaking several ribs, and he was in hospital for some time. And that incident sparked me to look into the laws that we have here on Prince Edward Island regarding dog control. What I found was an act that dated back to the 1970s and has many def deficiencies that make enforcement difficult and uneven across the province. With my constituent, and after discussing the situation with an alarmingly large number of people who have also been attacked and bitten by dogs, we drafted an amendment to close the gap identified in the old act. We met with officials from the department, and we were reassured that four years ago that they were working on a broader set of amendments, a full review, really, of the Dog Act, and that we should just hold tight and wait for that to be tabled. Over four years later, we're still waiting. A question to the Minister of Agriculture. <coughs> Will we see the new Dog Owners Act, which will replace the 50-year-old Dog Act in this sitting? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Public Safety, Attorney General and Deputy Premier. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, thank you for the member for the question. Yes, uh, we, we uh, realize the Dog Act needs to be updated, and uh, the comprehensive <coughs> review, it's probably one of the, <laughs> the largest comprehensive review that this Department of Agriculture has done. I mean, we've, we're still finalizing all the details, and uh, I hope to have it this, uh, at this sitting, Madam Speaker. Um, but uh, we know we've talked to the courts, the Crown, the RCMP, the Maine Society, Investigative uh, Enforcement Services, Madam Speaker, because this is important, and uh, we want to get it right. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member from New Haven, Rocky Point. I think I'm happy with that answer. I heard uh, uh, you hope to bring it forward in, in uh, this sitting, and I met with members of your department uh, just a couple of weeks ago who did tell me we're very, very close, but I, it's not on our list of legislation yet, but I'll live in hope. And of course, I understand how, com how complicated reviewing and developing a new piece of legislation is. Uh, but further delaying the, this bill perpetuates the, the entirely unacceptable situation that I expressed in my first question. To the same minister, why has it taken so long and why have so many promises to myself and others that this bill would be coming forward any day? Why have so many of those promises been broken? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Madam Speaker, this is an important bill that uh, we, we want to make sure we get it right. Uh, there's. Uh, a, a lot of people have a lot of opinions on it. I, like I said before uh, in, in my previous answer, the consultation, uh, the replies back we've got was overwhelming. And uh, as you can imagine, there's uh, differences of opinion. So it's uh, how we uh, get that right so that we can please the mass of the majority here. But uh, we hope to have that legislation soon. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member from New Haven, Rocky Point, your second supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I started by talk, telling a story of my <coughs> constituent that dates back uh, almost five years now. But of course, incidents continue to happen to this day. Just last weekend, a dog attacked another dog and their owner when they were out walking on the Confederation Trail. The injured dog ended up at the AVC and their owner at the emergency department at the QEH. The owner, Catherine Lewis, was informed by an animal protection officer, just like my constituent back in 2019, that given the limitations of the existing bill, they won't be issuing a fine or taking any action. And I don't know if you read the story, but it's horrific. Until we pass this new act, islanders will continue to be unprotected. To the same minister, what would you say to Catherine Lewis? and all the other islanders who have ended up in this situation because your bill has taken so long to come forward. The Honourable Minister of Justice, Public Safety. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I did uh, read that news article, and, you know, it's, uh, it was a sad story, and I uh, hope the recovery of Catherine's dog uh, is fast and steady. And, Madam Speaker, it's, uh, I believe that did happen in Charlottetown, so there is some uh, bylaws that are enforced, and I think the police did investigate that, so uh, we have to wait and see, but uh, we want to make sure we get this legislation correct, and we'll bring it as soon as we can. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member from Surrey, Elmira. Thank you, Madam Speaker. In a recent 5-4 decision, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled that police will now be required to obtain a search warrant for an IP address. An IP, or an internet protocol address, is a unique number assigned to every device connected to the internet. 
So my question is to uh, the Minister of Justice and Public Safety and Attorney General. What are the potential practical implications of this ruling for Prince Edward Island? Minister of Justice and Public Safety. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, thank you for the question, Madam Speaker. That's an important question, and we respect uh, the Supreme Court's ruling. We respect all their rulings, Madam Speaker. It might be a little bit premature on that. Uh, it's, it's still fresh, and we're still uh, evaluating it, but uh, we will, uh, we'll, we are looking into it currently. Thank you, Madam Speaker. M Member from Surrey, Elmira. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I look forward to uh, hearing uh, more information on that. So IP addresses are used by law enforcement in pursuits of a range of criminal activity like financial scams, drug trafficking, extortion, and sexual predators. It was a close decision with the dissenting justices raising concerns about upsetting the delicate balance between privacy and safety. So a question to the same minister. Are there any concerns that this decision might limit the ability of law enforcement to effectively pursue these types of criminal activity. Minister of Justice and Public Safety. Uh, thank you to the member from Surrey Elmire for the question. And it is a delicate balance, uh, and uh, it's one that uh, we, everyone takes quite seriously. And uh, I haven't had any concerns raised to us yet, but it's still new. Um, we will be reaching out to uh, our police agencies who do investigative work and uh, to see where, what we can do to help. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member from Surrey, Elmira, your second supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I appreciate the Minister uh, saying he will reach out uh, and be proactive on this uh, because time is of the essence in these types of cases. And I think some of the concern over this decision would be around the extra time to secure warrants for an IP address. So a question to the same Minister. Will our court system require more resources to help ensure that the expected increase in warrant applications can be dealt with in a timely manner? Minister of Justice, Public Safety. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, the member, for the question. And uh, like I said again, it's still early. Uh, we haven't had brought anything from the courts yet uh, on their opinions, but uh, we will work at this. We'll work with our staff and our department to come up with any, uh, if we need it, to add it, uh, add it staff. We will, we will do that. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member from Aldona. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, the Minister Fisheries over there looks like he's got a bit of a soft seat, so let's get him up and yeah. find out what's happening. <laughs> I'm uh, getting a, a few messages, Madam Speaker, about uh, the uh, state of the silting in and around the ferry terminal in Wood Islands, and I have no doubt that you are getting uh, the same, probably a lot more than, than me, Madam Speaker. Some of the concerns are uh, around the breaching of the nearby shoreline and the dunes that have allowed like, an inflow of sand uh, and uh, silt to build up around uh, the, the ferry terminal at Wood Islands. Question to the uh, Minister of Fisheries. Uh, are you aware of this, and what are we doing as a province to help lobby to make sure it's safe for the, the ferry when the time comes? Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And yes, I am aware of it. Actually, we toured the, the uh, Wood Islands Lighthouse and the park down that way back in the, I think it was the early summer or late, I know it was the fall, I think. And so there's actually a couple of issues. There's also there's the, the lighthouse and the park there, which because of the erosion through the dune, um, anytime there's a high sea and a, a windstorm and the wind comes from that direction, it, it's affecting the park and erosion. Um, but there's also the ferry um, and issues around dredging, which is important for tourism and, and trucking, but also the, the fishermen in that area that use the, uh, that use that harbor. And I do know that there is concerns from the fisher, fishermen in that area with the dredging that takes place, and they don't want that, uh, that to be put out on the lobster ground. So um, I know we've had discussions with DFO on that. Um, but I guess what I could say is um, we could reach out to DFO um, and small craft harbors, but I, I think in terms of the ferry, that dredging would be the responsibility of Transport Canada. Member from Moraldona. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. It's that time of the year uh, where dredging becomes an issue across the province. Uh, in the Minister's uh, mandate letter, it does say uh, support the fishery by increasing access to, uh, to dredging service. Uh, Minister, do you have a good handling of where dredging is required across the province uh, this year, coming up uh, this spring? 
and a timeline. Uh, we hear it every year in this house. Uh, usually, it's last minute. Where do we got to do? So, can you do you have a, a bit of a an idea of where it's required across the province and a, a bit of a timeline on when it can be done and what can you do in your role to help push the federal government on it, but also uh, to help out financially in any way you can, uh, so we can avoid this last minute uh, rush when uh, fishing comes this spring. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. So yes, we would <coughs> be in contact with DFO on a regular basis because a number of our wharves need dredging to open up for the spring fishery each year and, and as well in the fall, and but also throughout the year. A lot of our um, aquaculture industry also needs dredging. We would, we do do some dredging, um, mostly for uh, in terms for aquaculture and any uh, in any areas that we do control. Um, we usually try and work with uh, DF Small Craft Harbors to. So with that, when they're in the area dredging, we also kind of we partner with them to use that same company to do dredging because it's uh, significantly cheaper and, and it makes sense. Um, but yes, we do work with DFO. But I can say that in terms of Wood Islands, um, we'll reach out to DFO, Small Craft Harbors, and, and even Transport Canada through tourism as well to make sure that uh, the ferry can operate. And perhaps we can find a long-term solution because this is just going to keep happening with the dunes open. And uh, that ferry is so important for Eastern PEI and also the park there and, and the fishermen that use that harbor. Member from Raldona. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. And I'm glad the minister uh, referenced the, the, uh, the, the fishers in, in there as well. Um, the, the premier is actually the minister responsible for intergovernmental affairs too, uh, Madam Speaker. So uh, I'd like to, to get him on board as well for something like this and uh, take uh, strong notice of what the, the minister said. The, the dredging has to occur at the, at the ferry terminal. But there's also lucrative lobster grounds there as well that the fishermen are very, very sensitive of, and, and rightfully so, where all that material goes once it gets dredged. So it might be a, a, a bigger project or more expensive project than initially looked at. Uh, Premier, as the uh, Minister responsible for Intergovernmental Affairs, can you raise these concerns with your colleagues in the federal government uh, about both, about getting uh, the ferry terminal up and going uh, for our our uh, European diesel converted used ferry that's coming, and uh, and also to protect the, the local fishers that are there. The Honourable Premier. Uh, uh, Madam Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for the question. I mean, having just returned from uh, the Boston Seafood Show and having reported to this House the tremendous sense of optimism that there is in the lobster uh, sector this uh, winter and spring in particular, and knowing that area very well, not just lucrative, but I would say some of the most lucrative uh, fishing grounds in recent years uh, in, in the province. Uh, uh, I have spoken uh, at length uh, various times with the minister uh, responsible for PEI and the MP for Cardigan, who is, of course, um, uh, you know, very, very focused on Wood Islands and particularly the, uh, uh, the ferry, but the, uh, the fishery as well. Uh, I, so I will continue those conversations. We did have a chance, the minister and I, to meet with the federal fisheries minister while we were in Boston, uh, outlining a number of, uh, of areas uh, uh, of concern uh, that we need focus on. Uh, we will add this particular issue to the agenda, and I really believe uh, through uh, collaboration we can find a way to do what we need to do to keep the ferry moving and to keep that lucrative fishery being as successful as it is uh, because it benefits all islanders, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Member, for those questions. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, we've heard from the Premier and the Minister of Health not knowing too much about the MOU sign, so I'm going to ask the Minister of Workforce and Advanced Learning, Minister Responsible. Uh, Minister, do you know about this MOU, and have you been in discussions with other UPI or anybody about this MOU in, in total? The Honourable Premier. Madam Speaker, again, it's an MOU between two universities to uh, establish a medical school. Uh, it would have nothing to do with the government of Prince Edward Island. Uh, we are working with the university uh, to set up their medical school and working to prepare our system to accommodate it. That is what we are doing. Uh, the MOU between two independent uh, uh, universities would be something that they would discuss between those uh, entities. 
The honorable member from Charlottetown West Royalty, the final question. It's independent, but we pay the University of Prince of Wales on an operation grant of over $42 million, Mr. Premier. I'm asking, I'm asking the Minister of Advanced Learning, does she know about a simple MOU? And uh, I'm, I can't get the very most simple answer. So I'm asking you, again, Mr. Uh, Minister, uh, Minister of Advanced Learning, ha have you any recollection about this MOU and what are we doing um, to make sure that all these seats in Prince Edward Island that we're going to get for the med school are going to Islanders? The Honourable Premier. Again, uh, Madam Speaker, we certainly do fund the University of Prince Edward Island. Uh, it's very uh, good money that is well spent. Uh, we fund Holland College, but we don't get into uh, wanting to uh, or being involved in their particular agreements they might have with other agencies. Uh, as uh, I don't understand the premise of the question again. Uh, we are supporting the University of Prince Edward Island to set up a medical school. Obviously part of the process for them to set up a successful medical school with their partner is to enter into a memorandum of understanding of what the curriculum will be and how they're going to deliver that program. Uh, that's what the university does and we've been working with them closely and will continue to do so. And I'm glad to hear that the opposition has seem like they're moving back to their initial position, which is to get on Twitter and support the medical school. I'm glad to hear that and I hope Islanders are watching. They're coming around. They're coming around. <laughs> Question period. Statements by ministers. Presenting and receiving petitions. Tabling of documents. <coughs> reports by committees. <coughs> the member, sorry. Oh. The Minister Speaker, of Housing, Land and Communities. Madam Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg <coughs> leave to table properties purchased by the PEI Housing Corporation going back to 2021. And I move, seconded by the Minister of Finance. That the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall carry. Uh, the Honorable Premier. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. By command of Her Honor, the Lieutenant Governor, I beg leave to table order in Council EC 2024-217 informing the Legislative Assembly of changes pursuant to Section 5 of the Public Departments Act. Shall carry. <laughs> the Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Madam Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table the memorandum of understanding between UPEI and Memorial University related to the medical school that clearly the government has not seen. Um, and I move seconded by the Leader of the Opposition that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall carry. Sure. Reports by committees. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, as Chair of the Standing Committee on Health and Social De Development, I beg leave to introduce the report of the said committee on committee activities. And I move, second by the Honourable Member from Time Valley, Sherbrooke, uh, that the same be now received and do lie on the table. Will it carry? Carry. Pursuant to Rule 110.5 of the Rules of the Legislative Assembly of <laughs> Prince Edward Island, I will be moving the motion for adoption of this report for Tuesday, March 19th, 2024. Thank you, Member. Uh, <coughs> introduction of government bills. Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I beg leave to introduce a bill to be intentional and act to amend the Wildlife Conservation Act, and I move second by the Minister of Tourism. Uh, the same and I received and read the first time. Shall carry. Bill number 58, an act to amend the Wildlife Conservation Act, read a first time. Member, do you have an explanation? Yeah, so Madam Speaker, this is part of our move to modernize our, in this case, hunting, but I've talked about modernization of hunting and trapping, and this is to move to seven-day hunting. Thank you. <coughs> government motions, orders of the day government, uh, the Minister of Agriculture. Madam Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Finance. That the first order of the day be now read. Shall carry. Order number one, consideration of the estimates in committee. <coughs> Honorable Minister of Agriculture. Madam Speaker, I move second by the Minister of Housing, Land and Communities that this House do now resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole House to further consider the grant of supply of His Majesty. Shall carry. Shall carry. 
Member from Rest of Emerald, please chair committee of the whole. The House is now a committee of the whole House to consider the grant of supply to His Majesty. Minister, would you like to make a motion to bring a stranger to the floor? I would, Chair. Shall I carry? Chair, Welcome back, Kelly. Could you introduce yourself again and your title for answers? My name is Kelly Haas, Chief Financial Officer with Health PEI. All right, members, uh, we finished on page 116 of Health PEI and Human Resources. Uh, we've read it, but we have not passed it. And I uh, still have the member for Charlottetown West Royalty on my list. Would you like to continue? Um, sh sure. All right. Charlottetown West Royalty. Oh, okay. Um, just getting my. So is, is this. When we see the salaries being forecasted next year, we, we, we underspent on that by a little bit, and they're going up next year. And I think we kind of talked about that. Is that seem to be, is that enough funding next year to cover everything? Just getting my parents. <laughs> Actually. Yes. <laughs> Cheryl, do you want me to uh, move on? I can put you back on the list. Um, no, ju just okay. uh, I'll, I'll just go on um, um, just a travel and training that line. Um, so it's going up exponentially. I just need a better explanation for why we're forecasting so much in traveling training. Um, and can we can we talk about the that line for a minute? So on that line, as it relates to the budget for the 24, 25 fiscal year, that represents an investment to support internationally educated nurse relocation and supports. Cheryl, how was your audit? Okay, so how much is that uh, budgeted for? It's fair. One million seven twenty three nine hundred. Cheryl, how was your audit? Um, so, the the we went to to Dubai on a, a trip, and there was I think there was thirty one nurses. Then there was twenty seven, and I remember hearing about twenty two. How many from that trip, Minister, uh, are are in PEI now, and how many are scheduled to come? Gosh, I can I do actually have that data. I can yeah. table it as they arrive. I have it up till the month of April, I believe, but it's it's. I mean, again, we do have 113 in the pipeline. I would suspect that we would not close on all of them. Uh, they may have authors and other, offers in other jurisdictions, but so far we've, we've been, it's been high 80, 90% range. 
Sheraldine right. was Sheraldine. And how many, we, we, we talk about it in the budget line about being nurse nursing, but the, it's, it's hard for, we're recruiting nurses, but they have to come in as RCWs. Is, is, that, is that correct? No, that has changed with their uh, agreement, uh, with, I guess with SAS Polytech with the bridging program. Yeah, so they can start. They can start their training module training before they arrive, and then complete on the ground here. And they can enter our system as a provisional nurse, just instead of an RCW. So, okay. great change. Yeah, yeah that's good. Cheryl, thank you, Cheryl. And and they they still might need further support because I remember what we talked about. Um, there was a, a nurse starting a Beach Grove home, and, and I think she did start as an RCW. Correct. Yeah, we had, like I said, that first cohort, that okay. all those processes and pathways weren't in place yet, but they, they now are. Cheryl, how about Cheryl? Now, in this budget, is there is there bringing people in from another country who have been skilled might might have need uh, further education and support adjusting into our system of health? Um, what, what is being done? What is budgeted in here for... If, if there's 100 people coming into a new system, they're going to need additional supports. H how do we support them, and where's the budget line? Okay. We'll see in another section. Uh, well, we can talk about okay, the yeah. that specific item that we um, highlighted. So the internationally educated nurses relocation and supports um, up to... Uh, for up to 200 internationally educated nurses over the next 15 months. It could be used to provide a relocation up to 23,000 per IEN to support relocation and temporary living expenses. Um, just taking a look at some other investments in this area to kind of talk about. Uh, I want to talk about this one too. You would like this one. Oh, yes. <laughs> this investment will, it create, will create a fund to pay for compliance fees required by the International Mobility Program, <coughs> as well as provide ongoing diversity, equity, and inclusion training. Uh, Cheryl, I want to you one more. Yeah, and th that's got to be, we, we have to be ready ready for that, because that's what I'm hearing is this is great, but it, it's the the supports, and I mean, it, it is an equity training, is that's important too, but but incorporating into our system is where I'm wor was where I'm worried about because it's 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 difficult so, so. so in the budget we do have a settlement in the immigration coordinator position and uh, international assistant so we, we've we have strong supports with with that new position the settlement officer uh, board and Kinkora Uh, with respect to the line for grants, it's held comp constant. Uh, where does that money go, and what's that all about? So the grants for human resources uh, for nine hundred and thirty thousand. Yes, please. That is in relation to uh, educa educational grants for unions, UPSEs, IUOE, PEIN, and QB. Ford and Concora. And it's fair to say those funds get exhausted year over year? Those are grants issued to those unions. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, I believe they are very well utilized. Gordon okay. Gengora? With, with respect to the professional services uh, line um, and staffing and classification related to that, is, is that a purchase service from PSC or what classification is done under that line? That is correct. It is in relation to services with the Public Service Commission. Okay. Thank you. Boren A uh, question with respect to the uh, the people strategy. Um, just culture, healthcare framework to support a learning culture and psychological safety. Did I get that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, was there a workplace assessment last fall? Maybe it was HR HRA who did that and brought some concerns forward about the work environment, psychological safe work environment? I can't speak to that in relation um, to our budget if, okay. if okay. there was a workplace assessment done. Just a, a reminder to Minister and Kelly, uh, uh, in addition to nodding, also voice yes too, just so Hansard picks it up. Uh, Board and Concord. So just, just to confirm the answer, 
you're not, not sure if it was done or the outcome of that report or the, the assessment? Could you repeat the question? Um, I, I understood that there was an assessment completed last fall. Um, I believe it was HR Atlantic, um, which brought concerns forward uh, by some HR staff that that there was some concerns about it failing to provide a safe psychological work environment. I guess my question related to the budget is, well, if you're aware of that, you know, is that being addressed, the concerns raised from that assessment? I am not familiar with that report, but um, on a daily basis, if any issues are brought forward, I know the human resource team and others are very much respect recommendations brought forward. Okay. Board Member Cora? Is, is, is there any funds in, inherent in the, in the budget? As I guess it's hard, hard to predict, but I guess I'm wondering if, is there anything set aside for that, or is that dealt with if something comes up like that on a case-by-case -case basis? Is the question, is there funding hmm. for a workplace assessment or? To, to address outcomes from findings from workplace assessments, such as what I had understood was a workplace assessment that did confirm some concerns. So my question, Mr. Chair, would be, does, the, does Health PEI have anything set aside for that potentiality or it's case by case as, as, as an issue comes up in the workplace? Uh, so there is a labor relations team, an HR managers, and a director, and uh, a chief of human resources, which uh, they would be responsible to look at those. So uh, we would have human resources to support that. And as you can see from the table of documents, there are, are some uh, professional fees there if they require something in addition to that that could be utilized. I guess I guess further to that to some extent related would be un, under the purchase service line there's a budget for 30,000 but two, 217,000 was spent um, in relation to the employee assistance program um, how, how, how was that funding spent was that for was that an employee related expense for the EAP or for managers so I think you're referencing two lines. The line that notes other professional fee, fees EAP, that's EAP provided <coughs> through the Public Service Commission. So it will be for all staff to utilize. I believe the next notation you're making is in relation to a forecast value for purchase service general. Um, and just a couple of notes of that purchase service uh, would be for uh, work alone fees. Um, advisory services, um, in addition to what's noted in the table documents, plus services to to provide um, postings uh, for difficult to recruit to positions such as Indeed, LinkedIn, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Thank you. One more, Board of Concord. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I believe last year there was a management training initiative that was announced. I just wondering what the status of that initiative might be at this time. I can try and find the line. Is that a reference to the discussion yesterday on the learning management system? Yes. Itself? I, yeah. Okay. Um, I did speak a little bit about that yesterday. I did receive an update. And I'm just looking for my note. This is a joint initiative um, with uh, Health PEI, uh, some within core government, and the uh, public schools branch. The vendor has been selected, and currently the contract is under review. Um, it's under the initial review process. So I don't have an exact date of implementation, but it certainly has moved forward accordingly. Okay, thank you. Says. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, presently, I, I notice in here that with Labor Relations, there are, um, and I, I think the Minister had given a rundown the other day of what unions they're presently bargaining with. Could you just give me that 
list again if you have it handy. <coughs> Presently, what um, unions are you bargaining with that do not have contracts in place? So QP is mm -hmm. under negotiations. Upsy is under negotiations, and physicians are under negotiations. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Chair. Can you give me an update on how those discussions are going? Is there any, um, um, okay. I guess, a time frame you can give me when these negotiations may be um, ending and a contract signed? I don't have anything in my budget documents on specifics in relation to that. Leader of the Opposition. Okay, and I'm just asking this because I, the Minister did run through uh, a few, I think it was last week maybe, or early this week, on, on that. And I am hearing some rumblings, uh, in particular with OPSI's uh, bargaining, um, and they're quite concerned that maybe the negotiations are either stalled or um, are, are delayed a little bit. Is that correct? I don't think it'd be fair to comment on collective bargaining, and I don't think it applies to the budget. Honorable Member, can we uh, keep it on uh, the human resource section of uh, Health PI? Well, I, I, I beg to differ that it does. It is labor relations as part of this particular um, thing, so I'm not asking for particulars of what the negotiations are. It's just a time frame, and if the negotiations are presently being um, had. I've heard it also asked I'll, before, I'll, and I've heard the, the yeah, minister yeah. answer or, or the mm -hmm. about the allotment of yeah. money that's put in there mm -hmm. for when the inevitably that the uh, agreement is has reached. But the minister has mentioned a number of times now that he's not going to discuss those negotiations. So I'm not sure. I'm trying to find you an avenue here, but yeah. I don't see it yet. So. That's fine. I was just asking for a timeline because it, this particular. Um, Section on human resources does deal with labor relations. So I wanted to know how they were going and uh, just to get back to the individuals that have approached me on it. So I'll, I'll move on to another question, if you don't mind, Go Chair. Ahead. The Leader of the Opposition. Um, exit interviews. So I understand with physicians there is no ex mandatory exit interview. Is there any discussion on moving forward to mandatory exit interviews? so that we would have a better understanding of why so many doctors in particular, and we can move that into nurses, are leaving their positions here in Prince Edward Islands. Again, I don't, uh, legislatively, I don't know if we can make anyone uh, do a mandatory, uh, you can't, what's that? You can't, I don't think it's possible uh, to legally require people. I guess my one comment is that we, uh, especially on the physician side, it. Um, they have ongoing conversations that, you know, throughout the process to, to talk to our physician leaders, and so that, that does happen, so. Uh, Leader of the Opposition. Okay, well, thank you very much, Chair. So I'm not going to get anywhere with that um, question, line of questioning either, but it's very important um, to understand why uh, professionals in our healthcare system are exiting to be able to at least fix it and, and try to move uh, health care forward and Prince Edward on. So that's all I have to say. Shall the section oh, carry? Chair. Uh, Charles, how about Um Yeah, and just getting getting back to um, uh, the recruitment trips, which I think are which I think are great and well needed and, and will pay dividend. Is the, is there a return service agreement for a specific amount of time? Uh, associated with the recruits that we're bringing in internationally? I believe, yes, there is. It's either one or two years. I can't, I can't recall. Yeah. Uh, Cheryl, excuse me, Cheryl, can I watch Cheryl? Yeah, and maybe I'd, I'd just like to get, bring back like other one or two. It's, it's important because we're, we're investing a lot in, in that, and I'd just like to make sure that, that, um, that they feel welcomed and, and supported here and, and make sure that we're, we're uh, able to keep them. Uh, and retain them. So, um, and and with that, so that's twenty three thousand dollars they get per person. Is that annual? Is that annually? It's up to. I mean, there's uh, immigration costs associated with coming to Canada. Um, so it's it's up to. 
um, so it would cover mo a lot of immigration costs and perhaps some licensing and some testing requirements. And I'm glad that that officer that you mentioned, Minister, is there because that I think that we, we might find out if we're, if we're changing strategies that it's a lot harder to, to get through those things. And I, 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 I appreciate that. So, my like just giving your staff. Meet them at the airport and everything. Yeah. yeah giving the staff confidence to, to do this sure. and uh, to go and, and uh, you know, I mean, uh, whatever it's worth, you have my yeah. full support for. For, for doing that, it's just the details around it and, and, and how, we're, how we're integrating people into the system. And I don't think that was necessarily clear. I do believe it might be happening, but they, they really need to, to, to be able to get that support in with system, yeah. system stuff. So it gives me a chance to, to talk about a program that we have with the PI Nurses Union is where we actually, we actually compensate nurses. Uh, I believe it's up to three hours per week for a term of eight weeks. To, to do a mentorship program. So that could be outside of work. So we actually okay, compensate our existing workforce. Um, integration to practice, it, it has a name. Uh, it's not on my tip of my tongue, but it's a great program. And, and again, it includes simply having coffee with them. And, Good, and, and, yeah. and so, we, so we're compensating. We're not asking our, our nurses to support. We're, we're actually paying them to support. So, uh, Lee, uh, Cheryl, and Cheryl. So glad to hear that. And yeah, this is this is program. tough. This it's is a more. strong recruiting tool for us. Right. Sorry to interrupt you, but again, back to uh, some you know not even not international, but local nurses that they have told that that sometimes that's a big check mark that they get that support when they come in our system. Great. Excellent. Thank you. Um, just m moving. Cheryl, and Cheryl. Moving on to from that. Um, uh, just talking about the Peachy report had some pretty s specific um, recommendations. Um, in it related to recruitment and retention of healthcare workers, and it was, it's it's led by Health PEI, but it include having representation from the medical society. Um, to what extent have we actioned that Peachy report recommendation in this in a, the HR section? What is this related to the budget? That, uh, I guess I'll respond by saying when we look at that Peachy report, it'll be a report that is, is looked at very closely uh, over the coming years when we are actually looking to see what we need for our budget. Um, it provides a very great document to show this is the path forward and significant investments in human resources have been made to support those efforts accordingly. Okay. So we've made we've made positions to look at the Peachy report and how to implement. So those positions and are, are the positions in or are the people working at this time on that? Not specifically for that report. I was referencing investments in human resources uh, that have been made this year and even last year to strengthen human resources for those supports. Uh, one more, Cheryl. Yeah, and and we talk about with with human resources and um, recruitment uh, across the board, and it's been a it's been a topic. How how does Health PEI um, support the recruitment process in here? Do we have enough staff? It's just really complicated. As we, as a, there was a flow chart tabled and. Uh, this week, it's really complicated. Are we taking, is Health BI taking steps to to proactively recruit? Is that even possible? Recruit what, I mean, what, I mean, overall, or? Cheryl, can I show you a clarification? Yeah, um, recruiting overall doctors. Um, obviously, there's there's an international sex about nurses. Um, we, we have the recommendations uh, uh, the, in the Spindle report, we have to, we have a, a lot of work to do with doctors. How is Health BI contributing to, to this? Minister, is this a section for recruiting? No, not really. It's yeah. not, but I, I could speak to okay. some key investments in this okay. area that might help support it. So as mentioned earlier, the sell, Settlement and Immigration Coordinator, um, the Immigration Assistant, a Student Coordinator, a Recruitment Assistant. We look at uh, Talent Management, seven FTEs, um, uh, specifically a talent acquisition manager in support of 
nursing and six FDEs for your talent acquisition specialist. So all in supporting of looking at and working at the elbow with health PEI staff throughout that recruitment process, whether that is creating a position questionnaire, posting that position, how is that how are those recruitment efforts going? Okay. It's just as some examples. Excellent. Thanks a lot. So, Lead to the third party. Thank you, Chair. So I'm, I'm wondering about the, the Garth Weight report. So there were over 70 recommendations in that report. Um, what's the status of the implementation of that report? I don't have a status update with me on that report here for this budget to be made. More Please or less. Sorry, it's, oh, it's, sorry, a, Minister, it's go ahead. the implementation of the, goal, the just culture and people strategy. It's really the, the roadmap that we've, we've created in order to address most of those. Issues. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, I appreciate that. That gives some clarity as to kind of what the direction is with that. Uh, so one of the one of the identified uh, recommendations in there was a need for more management training, and I did see a mention of that up top. But have are there measurements that have been agreed upon to make sure that this training is indeed in effective? Is that part of the process? I mean, the just called for methodology is kind of proven to, to for outcomes that you know desired outcomes. So it's been implemented in other, lots of other institutions and, and industries. So again, it's kind of a methodology that's been proven in the past to, to, to adopt. Lead of the third party. Thank you, Chair. So there's no with this training. There's not really a built-in uh, budget line for um, review of. Uh, would be in this section anyway, would it? There's not necessarily a specific budget line, but as it is part of Health PEI's strategic plan, it would be one of those items that would be reviewed to identify how that is working. Thank you, Chair. And and I guess I kind of just jumping a little bit off of what uh, Charlottetown West Royalty was talking about. Are we conducting exit surveys now? Again, I remember that he yeah. asked the exact same question. Yeah. Minister, do you want to repeat? Again, voluntary. We cannot, we cannot enact mandatory exit interviews by law. The other third party. Is it something that people volunteer to do? Like how often would you see people volunteering to do that? An exit survey. I know it's not budget related, but it is kind of connected. Yeah, again, it's not budget related. I don't have the statistics. And again, I think it's, uh, I would say, back to my original comments, especially on the physician side, that we continue to talk to our physicians on an uh, on a ongoing basis. And we don't traditionally get a call on Friday that they're going to quit on Monday. That does not happen. It's a, it's a process, and they express some concerns. And it's an ongoing conversation, again, to, to what their needs and wants are so leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. My last comment would be I guess I just don't see the urgency to address the issues that have been identified as the reason that people are leaving. Um, I think I, I, under, I hear what you're saying about um, the legal aspect of not being able to conduct exit surveys by law. I just think it's just unfortunate we can't we can't get that information kind of on a regular basis, you know, so that we can ensure that we're staying on top of the, the conditions and environments that are that are forcing people out, people who would like to stay. I just think it's unfortunate. Anyway, that's just I'm done. Thank you, Chair. No problem. Uh, shall the section carry? Yes. Health informatics appropriations provided for the operation of health analytics, privacy, and information management, including record information management, freedom of information and protection of privacy act, and health information act. Administration 140,000. Equipment 62,700. Material supplies and services 800. Professional services, 105,300. Salaries, 2,185,500. Travel and training, 21,800. Total health informatics, 2,516,100. Shall I carry? Shall I West Royalty? Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. So, health information, obviously, a lot happening here. There was an underspend last year with salaries, um, can we just talk about that to get started? So we have vacancies with um, 
health data and, and information services, two analysts, two health information specialists or are also vacant. Uh, we had one health information and privacy um, on a leave and one analyst position that remained vacant. Cheryl Thomas Rody? That's a lot of uh, vacancies in this section. Is it is it hard to recruit to this section? It takes a certain expertise and skill, um, and we're, we're, our, our province is moving rapidly on this. Can you just talk about that? I have limited knowledge, um, other than the fact that they're very difficult to recruit to uh, positions. Um, some of the individuals that I know currently work in their, that area um, have PhDs, um, very strong, uh, well-educated individuals, so it's it's hard to recruit to areas. With digital security, emerging market, right? Very competitive, very high, yeah. high-end use. Cheryl, yeah. what's your royalty? And there lies the question is, the next question is, are, are we compensating these important workers enough to, to get them to re recruit and re retain uh, in this specific section? Very, again, very competitive industry. I don't, again, back to the budget. I feel like it, the salaries are appropriate. Cheryl, how much royalty? So we, there's a six, six hundred thousand dollar difference between what we spent, what we underspent, and what we're forecasting for. The forecast still goes up in this by six hundred thousand. Uh, what what is that for? Is it is it new positions? Is it so a portion of that are collective agreement uh, premium benefit increases? There's some annualized investments. You hear me speak of that yesterday. Um, for health analytics, because one of those positions uh, that I spoke of was new, and it is in relation to um, annualized funding for their uh, privacy and information management uh, and uh, record information management resources. Cheryl, how much, Cheryl? We talked about the underspend. Are, have you had any success in filling those vacancies we talked about a few minutes ago? Uh, I believe there has been, and uh, I'll, I'll speak to um, with the investments in HR that I talked about. Mm -hmm. I know from my own lens, from my own division, I work with them very closely yeah. to identify support that's needed, uh, such as I had indicated. So I understand that there is a lot of effort and support in this area to support that recruitment. Cheryl, can I wish Um So in the, the purchase and service, uh, the Canadian Institute of Health Information membership, did, 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 that, did, did that stay static? Is that, is, there's some, well, just some discrepancies there. Not, disc not very much, but. It's, uh, the budget uh, for that increased slightly from from the year before, and it's just slightly under the budget, just slightly under the forecasted value. So, okay. Uh, one more, Charlotte, was rather. And and where are we with um, health health information in our province? Um, I guess we, we see that, that we're, we're struggling struggling a little bit with a few different positions in there, but health information and the Health Information Act is is important for Islanders, and there's talk about, you know, there, there's a shift. Um, are, are we doing a good enough job in Prince Edward Island of making sure that both the information is protected and, and that we're on the right track for uh, for Islanders to get proper health information? And I hear this a little bit as an MLA. It's, it's, it's different from a few different places that we go. Uh. Is your question really about requests for information and approximate values, I'm trying or specifically to, on the protection? Like, so we have the health PEI and the, the budget book mm. here. We have the minister, and Kelly, your position was what again? Chief financial the officer. The chief financial officer. So can, I'm not sure we're, or uh, Charlotte and Westroyd, you're, you're wondering, are we doing a good enough job of the Health Information Act? Managing our health information of, of, of Islanders is that we're, we're, we're between systems, um, well, I would think. And I mean, 
it's it's I, I hear this often enough when, when Islanders come to us and say I have to bring my records to um, to with me and I, I I don't I don't really know if everybody's managing health information the same way across Prince Edward Island. So I guess are we managing health information? The I don't same? remember this is a policy question. Charlton West Shirley. We we just talked about having not enough vacancies in the section. So it's it's policy, but where policy comes from, we have to have the people there to provide the policy. Absolutely, and you asked those questions about those people. Yeah. Cheryl Hamish Rowley. And do, does my question stand now? No, I, you were asking about policy. Your questions about the budget absolutely will stand. <laughs> so, Chair, I'll, again, I'll try to relate to the budget. It's to increase the HD funding that we receive from the federal government. One of the pillars is data and health informatics. So from a budget perspective, the federal government has, is supporting, strengthening our health and data process. There we go. <laughs> no collaboration, Thank honorable member. Thank you. Cheryl and West Rosie. Thank you very much. So how much have we received from the federal government <laughs> in, this, in this budget line, and where would I find it? CHD goes into general funding. It does. It does. It goes into the, all the CHD transfers go into general revenues. Uh, I have. Uh, do you want to be back on the list? No. Uh, Borden Kinkora. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just have a, a, a general budgetary preparation question. Maybe, maybe it's just my newness in the role, which I'll use for as long as I can get away with using. Um, Some people used it for years. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Go uh, ahead. Look, looking at the equipment line, you know, last year budgeted 62.7, spent 55. We're back up to 62.7. Looking at travel and training, budgeted last year 21,200, spent 6,000, back up to 21,8. Is is it normal to Go back to a number that was not used for going forward. If we actually used a quarter of what was predicted or budgeted, why, why would we bump that number back up to where it was when we know in reality we didn't need all those funds? Mm -hmm. So for the specific equipment line, uh, there was funding to support the, the uh, implementation of uh, our studio software and there was a slight delay so it's expected that it will be spent in our fiscal year 24 25 uh, and in relation to travel and training We have seen some decreases uh, for out of province due to uh, being able to meet virtually in some cases. Uh, so that's something that we're continuing to monitor because that, that seems to be changing a little bit before us. But it's also tied to the vacancies that we've had in this particular area as it relates to um, the Health Analytics Division. Board and Court. So, so it's anticipated that the, the travel expense will go back to, to what it, or training, sorry, travel and training expense will go back to, you know, notwithstanding virtual, there will be the we, need for it. We expect so, but those numbers will be closely monitored, and if we saw a significant trend that they weren't being used in the future, there could be consideration of reallocating those dollars. Board and Kinkor. I guess just further to the questions from Charlottetown West Royalty, and I, I don't think it was specifically answered this specific one, but given the competitive nature of, of, the, of, of the market we're operating in here, have the salaries increased significantly in the past five or ten years? I don't think I heard that answer specifically. I'm sorry, I just I didn't catch the very last part of your question. The, 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 the salaries with respect to getting the people we need in this competitive market, have they kept up with private, have they kept up with other jurisdictions to be attractive? I don't know how it relates to the budget. Again, it's kind of speculating on whether we're competitive or not. Well, I, think, I, think, I think the question does relate to the budget in that, do we, are we budgeting enough? Um, simply put, to attract the talent that we need for these highly technical, you know, 
positions that require a lot of expertise. So, you know, the question again is, have our salaries for these positions kept pace uh, enough over the last few years? Uh, I, I believe there's an understanding that there are some hard to recruit to positions in this area, and I do believe that our Human Resource, Resource Division is working closely with these, and one of the things that would be looked at would be the classification of the positions. I don't know any any details beyond that, but I do believe absolutely that that, that is something that's being considered. Okay. Okay. Are you good? Uh, one, one more? Yeah. Uh, uh, just point out too that the minister had answered about the hard to recruit positions and, and he felt that the salaries were competitive and it, the emerging market and all that kind of stuff. Like, there was a good conversation between Charlotte and West and the minister on that as well. Okay. Uh, Board and Kinkora. Um, with respect to the data being collected, has, has there been any breaches in the past year? So I have uh, privacy complaints uh, reported to the Information and Privacy Commissioner for 2023 were three. That's I'm just taking a read of. They may not be related to technology per se, though. Right? So I'll just read a comment that I have in my notes. Um, to date, the commissioner has issued uh, orders pertaining to breaches reported by Health PEI, and in all cases, found that Health PEI responded appropriately. I don't have any more details besides that. Board Kikora. Um, so I, I guess bringing it back to the to the budget, you know, you know, I heard the comment that yeah, there were three three breaches and. Some, someone mentioned three more than it should be, which obviously is obviously we're looking for zero is, is the, what we want. Uh, is, are the resources available going forward to make sure these things don't happen again as much as we can? I remember she just mentioned that they were deemed done for appropriate, right? I guess I'll, what I'll touch on is just investments that we've made uh, this year and the previous year in this area uh, will we'll strengthen supports across. Okay. Thank you. Shall the section carry? Interoperative electronic health record, appropriations provided for the development, implementation, and support for the integrated electronic health record and virtual care. Administration, 47,900. Equipment, 32,600. Material supplies and services, 5,691,900. Professional services, 270,500. Salaries, 4,306,400. Travel and training, 55,800. Total interoperative electronic health record, 10,405,100. Uh, Cheryl, Dan, which reality? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just going to start off with uh, virtual care. Um, in, in that. So w would the payment for our virtual care services be in material supplies and, and services? Is that an So could I ask for a specific when you say virtual care? Sure, I'll tell you Yeah, the payment to, our, to Maple, is that, would that be in this section? No. Sure, and thank you, Sheldon and for clarifying yeah. that. When we get very specific with our questions, they're much easier for them to answer rather than, mm -hmm. not, yeah. not you, but when some members will do fishing expeditions if we can get to the <laughs> point. So that, yeah. I appreciate Sorry. that. But your pole Fish, you know, Maple, perfect. Sheldon and West <coughs> so when it says um, virtual care in here under the um, explanation, what what are we what are we talking about? If I could make a clarifying point, uh, initially some of the platform costs were within this section, and there's a much more significant investment in primary care. Is how I'll describe that. Cheryl, now what's wrong so <coughs> we should deal with those questions within primary care, if possible, Chair. Is that so? Are you with that, Chair? No, no. Well, well, why is it in this? Why is it in in here? Is it, it was set up not last year. It was able to be changed. Why wasn't that changed 
in in the budget book if it's not being if, if services aren't here this is two or three years ago we, three or four years ago we've had um, maple so there's no there's no budget line in here about virtual care there's no budget dollars in in this section There's some funding to support uh, virtual care as it relates to um, the operation of it. Um, so it provides telephone and vi video technical support Monday through Friday during regular business hours to both the public and the providers. So just my comment on when you noted for Maple, the majority of that investment is in primary care. So my apologies yeah. for for that, but there are supports in here. The, um, let's go take a look at one more thing. There are also supports in this area as it relates to the implementation of the home care solution NRI. So this section does have supports for those systems that, that were set up, if you will. For example, in home care. Um, just looking for a couple of more examples for you. In the speed, oh, should we? Should yeah, I think you just look at something up for you. Sure. So as an example, um, here you would find the licensing for um, Zoom for Healthcare. And Telemerge and Virtual Care Operational Statistics. I do have some stats for those, about 20, 2,700 as of, you know, December 2023, so it's number of e-visits, if you will. Cheryl, can I Cheryl? Um, so it sounds very much like a supporting mm -hmm. stats, 2,700 e-visits for home care solutions, home care. And in the, the platform, there was, a, two years ago, I didn't understand it, it said virtual long-term care. Was that what this is? What? I had no idea what that was, the speech from the throne. I didn't know how you can provide virtual long-term care, but it and was sir, in there. Is he mixing up two definitions of platform? Ah, no. Okay. I didn't Hard know what that <laughs> So I'm just, I'm just confused. Are we, are we no. virtual? <laughs> well, I'm not I'm confused. Sure. I'm going to ask the floor. And yes, right thank to ask you. Whatever question no, please. I'm not, I'm not confused about, <laughs> I'm confused about what I'm hearing because I care about this and I've been looking at this for a very long time, but it seems confusing to, to what we're doing here in this section. So perhaps I can speak to some of the virtual sure. care initiatives. So I'll further clarify that some of the platform costs to support some of these virtual care initiatives that I'll speak of yeah. are within this section. Um, but when I heard you say Maple, the majority of that investment is in primary care. So further clarification. So there will be some platform costs in primary care as well. Sure. So I'll just take a minute and describe some of those initiatives sure. um, planned for the coming year. So it's uh, the transition of virtual care project resources to e-health operations and expanding the focus of virtual care to support e-health. Enhancing data management, uh, the employment of the health information specialist and data integrity analyst, um, remote patient monitoring hardware and software support model. So that's a, a model or supports that are within home care, but this section helps to support it. Uh, there's going to be work on a virtual care guidance document to help better understanding of virtual care and what that looks like. Um, those are some key ones, and just taking a look at some initiatives for the past year. Uh, Cheryl, do you want more? 
Yeah, and, and I just want to say how, how important these questions are because it is moving towards virtual care. And I think health PEI, we all, we all know that and we have to accept it. And I just want to make sure I know what questions to ask and make sure that, that the programs are being run out because this, this is all new and I appreciate the work with home care and I, I think that this is a good discussion to have on the floor to see what Islanders can be getting and how we can support their loved ones at home or as they as they age. So I appreciate that. You can just put me back on the list for another time. Sounds good. Uh, Borden Gingor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I don't think I, I heard reference, but if I did, I apologize. Does virtual care include anything to, to do with te telemedicine? Telehealth. Telehealth. Mm -hmm. Is that is that still included under this section? Yes, there will be supports for that here. Sorry, I didn't. I didn't know if you were looking for something. Is there a certain question oh, on telehealth? I guess is that something that's going to be expanded further, given the other aspects of virtual care, the telehealth piece, or is that going to fall behind some of some of the other? Uh, I, I think it, it will basically continue on, but if we are looking at um, expansions in that area, the, the focus, as you'll hear us talk about a little bit, in primary care is a bit the expansion of a, a, a platform similar to that of Maple. Yeah, okay, that was, okay. Uh, or another, Cora. I guess I also see in the, in, in a little further on, um, in, under the um, departmental section, the digital digital health. There's a section for digital health. Um, is there overlap? What's what's the difference between the the interoperative electronic health record section, health PI, and the digital health section under health and wellness? <coughs> I can touch on that. So uh, when we when we look at that, so I'll focus on, for example, the example of the EMR, and the Department of Health and Wellness will be responsible for the implementation, where Health BI is responsible for the day to day. So a lot of the section that we're in now is support the operational support for the EMR, or CHR as people refer to it. That's the primary a lot of of this, and the electronic health record at our hospitals. Board in so that, that's what's captured under this section. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I'd have another question just generally looking at, at the section high level. Um, there doesn't seem to be a huge, huge amount of change um, given sort of the pervasiveness of what we talk about r fairly regularly in here about v virtual and e, you know, CHR. Uh, are, we, you know, is, are we looking at enough? contribution towards this given the given where we've been over the last little bit and what we need to accomplish further just want to take a look at a couple of the investments that were initiated last year to give you a sense of that because there were significant investments last year um, so I'll be looking at some of our annualized investments so when you look at an annualized investment for this year um, it is for uh, the operational supports for the EMR 300,000 in this budget, but when you look at that over 22-23, um, saw 2.4 million, and 23-24, 458,000. So, and this would be that uh, one more installment at 300,000, so okay. very significant. Board and concur. Uh, that's fine, I'll pass. Mr. Chair, good. Uh, New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you, Chair. And Kelly, thanks as always for your incredible knowledge on, on this department. It's un, almost unbelievable, actually, how you pull things up. Um, I, I want to start by asking a general question about the implementation of our CHR, EMR, EHR. <laughs> I'm never quite sure what acronym to use here. I have some detailed questions on it, but I'm wondering if you could or the minister give us a, a, uh, an update on the implementation of it generally? I sure can. As of January 2024, more than 198 family practitioners, nurse practitioners, and specialists 
have implemented the provincial EMR in 84 clinics with approximately 1,000 total users. New Haven Rocky Point. Right. Um, and what percentage of our offices does that represent, 119 GPs and MPs? Uh, it does surpass our original goal of 167 providers um, and now accounts for more than 90%. Not, yeah. So we're going to just. So the original goal was 167 providers, but in, in, now we're at accounts for more than 90% of our family practitioners and nurse practitioner communities. New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you, Chair. And I know there were questions asked today about interprovincial compatibility, but there are also concerns about intra-provincial uh, compatibility, and we've talked about that before. I don't think this sitting, but we, but it's been talked about. And uh, you just gave us numbers for uh, medical offices. Ninety percent is really great penetration, and I'm, I'm, I'm impressed mm -hmm. to hear that. But of course, the health system is is much more than that, and I'm wondering whether. For example, <clears throat> I'll start with the dental community since they are increasingly um, funded by through public dollars for the not the not just the provincial program but when the federal program comes online. Is there compatibility between the dental community and the EHR system that we have? I, I wouldn't I wouldn't know the answer to that question. Again. Not specifically budget <laughs> budget oriented, but uh, I wouldn't. We wouldn't be. I would know. We wouldn't know. I doubt Kelly would know. Would you know, Kelly? No. Mm. There is a billing system in place, but as far as health records, I'm I'm not aware. I, I can't respond to that. New Haven Rocky Point. Yeah, I I was. Uh, even within the dental community, there is a wide range of uh, electronic health record products available and I was thinking about the from a billing point of view yeah I, I understand there will be you know for digital radiographs and things like that it may not be possible um, uh, tying this into the uh, budget having spoken to other provinces where uh, CHR was introduced uh, there's obviously a large upfront capital cost in the first year and then ongoing operational costs thereafter and the message that I received, this was prior to PEI choosing the system that we did, was make sure you choose the right system to start with because the costs involved in retrofitting or, or workarounds to make your system operate properly can dwarf the original cost. If, you, if you're going to save a few million dollars up front, don't assume that over the lifetime of that product that that is, a, that that is actual savings that you're getting because you may be in, into problems. So all of these questions regarding compatibility directly relate back to the budget because any incompatibility takes time and costs money. So I'd, um, I, I hope, Chair, as I ask these questions, without actually making reference to a budget line, uh, it's clear that any issues that we're having with the EHR have a direct budgetary impact. You yep. have the floor? Yeah. So, you mentioned the number of uh, GPs and NPs that are tapped into this. Is the system that we had previously in the hospital, the signer system, is that working well with the TELUS system that we are importing into our GPs' offices? So actually, first of all, I just want to update, I guess, for the record, again, um, I have an, an updated number here, but there are actually 216 providers okay. on the EMR in 95 clinics. So Excellent. As opposed to... That was fast. Yeah, just I, page two. Um, <laughs> and that was dated March 12th. <laughs> um, so again, a, a newly updated uh, record. I guess, you know, TELUS is, um, there's been a consolidation of, of EMR providers in the last five, seven years. They've bought each other, so on and so forth. So it's important to note, like, tell us uh, nationwide would have, we represent a, such a small percentage of their installed base. Um, so again, I think we are with a major provider and interoperability back to QP today. Um, we continue to work with providers as they merge to, to, to create interoperability. So I guess it is technically kind of reference your dental um, um, questions that there's many systems, and we can't force 
Nova Scotia and New Brunswick to adopt TELUS, so to speak. I do believe Newfoundland is moving to TELUS. I think, I, I, you know, from that, they're moving to that system. So, again, I guess that's not a great comment. I couldn't really comment on Cerner and its interoperability, you know, to give you a great answer, to be honest with you. Okay. New Haven Rocky Point. Uh, uh, it's kind of an important question, though, because yeah. uh, primary care, of course, is provided typically through, um, well, increasingly through medical homes, but, but GP's offices and, and NP's, and then secondary and tertiary care is in our hospital system, and, and all the time those, those two are communicating with each other. So to know that this, the existing CERNA system and the telesystem that we bought, and I, I'm going to dig down a little bit more on, because when we say telesystem, it suggests that there's just one telus product, and that's not the case, of course. But just going back to the Cerner and TELUS systems, uh, are, are they working well together? One thing we did do, and, and it's, a, it's a discussion in the part, we had a technical briefing on the EMR system probably back in the fall. Very helpful. Uh, my suggestion to the department, we should have recorded it mm. to provide it to, or, and I'm not sure if, if, you, if you were invited, but it was extremely helpful to the media uh, to understand these, these types of questions. Sure. So we did do a technical briefing on it. It was very valuable. And my comment after is, gosh, it would have been great to have that in the can, so to speak. So they talked about, so I think it's an ongoing discussion about further technical briefings in our department. But it was very valuable and it sure. cleared. It was, it was quite helpful. Yeah. Sure. Quite complicated, <laughs> but quite helpful. <laughs> so I don't know if we extended an offer to, to, your, to, your, to yourselves or not. I'm, I'm not, not sure. I don't, I, it probably was media-based. Um, but New Haven another, Rocky Point. Another suggestion going forward. Thanks, Chair. And uh, yeah, I'm not sure, Minister. I couldn't mm. speak to whether you yeah. applied it or not. But it certainly, it, it, I could well have missed it. That's something that I mm. would, I would be interested in, in finding out. Um, so the, to talk about the tele system that we have, can you, um, again, ha has huge budgetary implications. Other provinces run on a telesystem, or some entirely and some in part. Um, but as far as I know, none run on the same version of a telus EHR as we do. Is that correct? I don't believe so. No, I, and again, no, it's, it's, I don't believe so that that, again, there's been a lot of consolidation and um, product merging within the, 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 the business, right? They don't want to... Uh, support four different versions of. So there is a lot of, it's changed significantly over the last couple of years about the number of versions and so on. I know sometimes you refer to it as beta and it's absolutely not beta. Again, back to my comment that the version, the, the, the implementation that we use is used by thousands across Canada. It's worth, yes, yeah, I was very distinct in asking that question is that are we using a beta version of, of a certain product and the answer was that there was thousands of tell us wouldn't tell us, tell us wouldn't tell us <laughs> uh, specifically. But in response to my question, because I know you've you've expressed that before, yeah. and I wanted to clarify for myself uh, that they said there is literally thousands using what we use in Prince Edward Island. So, but they would not disclose seven thousand or fourteen thousand or what that number was. Their answer was literally more than thousands, right? Which is good. New Haven Rocky Point. Thanks, Chair. So I think we need to make a distinction here between um, a provincial overarching EHR system and that used by indi individual elements of that system. And uh, there may well be thousands of users uh, who are, in, to a certain extent, and in some way using the, the version of the TELUS product we have. But I, I don't believe there are any other provinces that use it as their if I can say foundational um, software, is, is that true? I would I'd say the comment really is most of the other provinces are quite fragmented. Again, Ontario has, there's been lots of discussions in Ontario that there's, they have three major systems that they're using and that it's causing interoperability issues. It's been in the media lately that they, I think, will need to move to one vendor. Well, back to your comments, which will cost a lot of, a lot of money. Uh, New Haven Rocky Point? Sure. 
I'm going to keep going down this line because it's it's pretty fundamental, and I, I I'm going to have to revisit the information that I have. It's a while since I've read it, but um, the Telus system, which is used in uh, other provinces, and I, I I do recognize that Ontario, partly because of its size and the number of health authorities that exist there, uh, it is fragmented. <laughs> not the model that we, but it, I mean, it's also a province that, in terms of population, is mul multiple times bigger than us, but. Better competitors would be um, Nova Scotia, for example, uh, even Manitoba, where they do have one system. As, and I, again, I stand to be corrected on that. It's a while since I've read about this. But the, obviously the goal for a province is to have one system that, that manages everything and through which all of the other providers can flow. And there is a telesystem which existed when we bought ours, and I, I know you said this morning that we were ahead of the curve, I think was the phrase that you used, Minister, but the other Atlantic provinces had CHR long, long before we did. And so I'm going to push back on your comment there where you sort of transferred the blame for the issues we're having on that the other provinces didn't, their systems aren't compatible with us, but they were there first. So. It strikes me that it was our responsibility to implement and purchase a system here that would be compatible with those that already existed. And will you confirm that the TELUS system that we use on Prince Edward Island is not the same TELUS system that they use in Nova Scotia or New Brunswick? Again, get back to my specific answer. Again, when again, I know you've expressed concerns that we're using a, a beta version, for lack of a better description. I simply asked that question that, you know, how many other people are using our system? And they did not specify where and when, where these thousands of users are. So I can't answer your question. I guess from our user perspective, we did do surveys last February. It's been a year. And you know we had 75% of the respondents reporting that they're coordinating patient care better with the use of the EMR. 71% um, agree strongly that the access to information in the CHR is more comprehensive than their previous patient records. 70% of the respondents are beginning to see efficiencies with their clinical workflow. That was a year ago. And those numbers, I think the numbers continue to improve. Again, change management is hard, but once uh, the clinician or, uh, you know, again, the new workflows, um, it's been quite positive. One more? Yeah, uh, sure. Rocky point. Uh, okay, um, who chose that system? There, there must have been somebody ultimately who made the choice for us to buy that system. Could you tell us who that was? Long before my time. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. And a, another government, I would assume. Perhaps. I'm not sure of the dating of that, yeah. I, I'd love to know if you could come back with that information. I, I would very much appreciate it. Can you put me back on the list, please? I can, yeah. And important topic. We're <laughs> finding that line of, of budget related. That but last I question. appreciated the discussion back and forth for sure, but if we could <laughs> narrow it in on whoever. Good. Thank you, Chair. Good question and answers. Uh, Board and Kokora. Thank you, Chair. They, I guess I'm interested in, in you know, the, the success. I think we've, we're now over 90%, the last, the last number. Um, might be changing by the minute uh, to the positive, which is great. Uh, how is the training component keeping up with the onboarding and the on-ramping of this? And do we have enough allocated to ensure that the clinicians and physicians are supported as they have this rolled out for them? So if I could just speak to some of those investments that I talked about earlier, I can maybe talk about some of those roles and it might help to understand. So over those three years that I spoke of, there was 11 FTEs, a program manager, a change management and communications lead, um, EMR advisors and trainers, an EMR coordinator, and a data resource or EMR information specialist. Um, the health programming me lead and a security advisor auditor. Board and concord. That's all captured under the the um, section on 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 salaries. 
Um, it, it would have been over the three years. So earlier I mentioned the three-year investment yes. of $3.16 million. So this year it was 300000 and the 300000 was more for materials. So you'll see that as an increase under your material supplies and services stamp. So I'll carry. Uh, I still had some more questions. Okay, just to raise your hand when the board and concord. Sorry, sorry. Just to make sure when, before, when the answer is done, make sure you just give me a notification. Otherwise, I don't know if you need one or not. Board and concord. Thank you. Um, New sheriff in town. Um, I, I guess on the on the, the question, I, another question that leads from that is the the professional services section was underspent by a couple of hundred thousand dollars. Was there a particular reason for mm -hmm. that? When we look at that section, um, there was a project, but this is a capital project. It's called um, the Women's Health Module. The fees associated for the professional contract services, because it was a capital project, were charged to our capital project rather than our operational budget. So it's just a one-time. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Do you have in Rocky Point? Oh. I still had, a, I had my hand up. No, you didn't. You had it down. <laughs> you have your rocky point. <laughs> I'd come back to you. I'll put you back on the list. Thanks, Chair. Uh, okay. Um, the questions that were asked this morning in the question period regarding that patient, um, that email actually came in, ironically, while I was sitting in uh, the in a hospital in Halifax. Uh, with a family member who was there f for a referral to see a specialist for a treatment that cannot be provided here on Prince Edward Island. And uh, again, the irony of the situation was, uh, was quite extraordinary because we were waiting to speak to a surgeon who was waiting for the electronic health records to come from our GP's office here. And we waited and waited and waited and ultimately the, we had to go ahead with the consultation without that information because there was, and I don't know whether the breakdown was at their end or our end, but it, it was a real lived experience for me and somebody in my family of the, of the real time implications of a system that, that's not compatible. And I know the questions this morning, we talked a little bit in my last set of questions about interprovincial, uh, sorry, intraprovincial, but we're talking here interprovincial. Um, what, what, what measures are we taking to make sure that the, the EMR systems between ourselves and New Brunswick and Nova Scotia principally where more and more patients are going to see specialists for care that they can't receive here, that that sort of situation that our family ended up with and the lady who's, who was uh, referenced in the questions this morning so that that stops. I, I guess back to you know, giving the honourable member a better answer to that question. Again, um, the virtual hallway platform is not the answer to your question, uh, but since we've implemented the virtual hallway, we have 174 registered users on PEI, which includes 132 primary care providers and 42 specialists. Uh, we have 80 registered specialists from Nova Scotia on that platform. So since the launch, we have done over 430 consults. So of those 430, 87% of those consultations on Virtual Highway avoided the need for a specialist referral, which is great. Helps our system. Don't travel to Halifax unnecessarily. So on a, and again, um, we do some surveying, and the primary care, care providers read, uh, rated their satisfaction with VH as 4.8 out of 5. So I think there's some implementation as we move more people on that perhaps um, that burden will, will will lessen but it's not really an answer to that particular question about interoperability. Okay. Or in Gregora? Oh, Sorry. I had my hand down momentarily and I lost <laughs> it. I just, I just want to go back to the, the, the training question that I had before. I understand there was uh, 11 FTEs and so on uh, dedicated to, to that. I, I just see the, the importance of, of, of not only getting this rolled out, but the, the, the training piece be there. Was there any consultation with the, with the, the, the clinics and the facilities and the physicians, the, the end users, as to whether that, 
they, they're getting enough, or should there have been more? Should there be more? Or are they are they through any consultation satisfied with what's available for the for the training? Uh, I'm not aware of kind of uh, you know a review at this point in time, but I know there was an extensive review of what those possible needs were when I speak about what that level of investment was. So I don't have any anything further on, uh, I think what you're almost referring to is an evaluation. What does that look like? Um, I don't have any of that information before me. Okay. Warden Kikora? So just to clarify, you're not aware of any evaluation <coughs> or, or you don't think there was an evaluation or a consultation? I don't have you? that information with me. Okay. You have an Rocky Point? Thank you. Uh, so just looking back, uh, I see that TELUS Health, which is our EMR system, it was purchased in 2021, so it was absolutely in the mandate of this, within the mandate of this government, although under your predecessor, uh, Minister, uh, just for the record, just to make sure that, that that's there. So very recently, three years ago, and um, it was purchased by this current administration. I just, I just wanted to make that absolutely clear and on the record. Uh, going back to the, uh, the system we have, you mentioned how many of the, the GPs and the NPs and the offices here on PEI have signed up. Have you, have, you, have you had situations where providers have left the system, have stopped using EM, the EMR? Because again, of again, back to my statistics, we're in the plus 90 percent. Uh, again, some people maybe perhaps in the twilight of their career, there might be some <coughs> resistance to converting to CMA, C, EMR uh, when we understand that. So I think across the country through chi high data, I think it's, it's, it's about 93 percent of family physicians are currently using an EMR. So it is the way things are done, I suppose, these days. Okay, from Rocky Point. Yeah, ab ab absolutely. It's a... Uh, I think apart from anything else, if we don't have a well-working, fully penetrated EMR here, uh, it's going to make recruitment and retention difficult. I mean, we've heard stories of individual GPs leaving because of the, the problems they were having with EMR, and, and no doubt uh, that's one of the things that prospective doctors would look like, uh, would look at when they're considering which province to go to, uh, would be the the electronic medical health record system and, and how well it's working. Last year, we there were a lot of lost referrals um, between offices, and I remember there was some glitch, I think, with the, with the transfer of records. Um, it was over 1,700 last year. I'm wondering if you can update us with that glitch um, and whether we're still having issues of lost records. Um, member, uh, can you relate that to a budget? Yes, be, absolutely. Yeah, uh, when l records are lost, uh, that requires considerable clinical time, firstly to acknowledge and identify that that's happened, and se secondly to rectify the problem by either getting the patient to come back in for a repeated screening or whatever the issue was, and in between offices, a ton of clerical time. Uh, for, I did send you that record. No, you didn't. Where did it, yeah, you know, it's just it's a huge time suck, and therefore no. a, a large expense. Right, I mean, I understand it's it's a large expense. That that would be an expense not in this section, right? I mean, if you're talking about oh, all those different absolutely things, absolutely would. But if um, well, the, these are these are not clerical salaries and all the rest of it. No, for but within chair. the system. But if you're saying like the budget needs to be increased to make sure we fix the EMR and make it more efficient or something, or go ahead. Remember? No, but it absolutely falls into this section because this was a specific problem related to the EMR, the 1,700 plus lost sure. records last year, yeah. and uh, which did it, it represent Mr. a large Hurley, cost. Again, uh, I guess from your question about data breaches this year, none that I'm aware of. Secondly, I think it's important to note on the EMR system, yes, that we did have lost referrals, but previous to an EMR system, we would not even be able to identify that we had lost renewals. Like if you're a paper system and we had faxed Dr. Smith's office and they didn't act on it, there was no trail um, to identify a lost referral. And again, I, I, from the, what I understand, the data breaches is that now that they've, they've created redundancies and uh, checksums in the system to reduce the possibilities of that happening. So that I would, 
I'm a positive person, I would say that's a, a benefit to an EMR system. Uh, member from New Haven, Rockaway. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and I, I agree. I mean, that's one of the real benefits of a, a well-functioning electronic record system is that you, you, you do have good records yeah. <laughs> within the system, I, uh, and and that that sort of thing gets picked up. Um, do you have? We knew it was. We know it was over seventeen hundred last year. Do you have an actual figure from this year of referrals that were lost? Again, back to my answer, our office, my off, our office, our department has not been informed of any loss renewals. So, so, and again, member, okay. so are you saying you think you would like to see the budget increased here for health analytics <clears throat> so that we can better track these referrals that are lost? Or, you know, I, I, I'm just, I'm trying to relate it directly to this section. I appreciate I understand that. your point is very well taken. I'm obviously, re, if you lose referrals, that's, that has a, a, a huge impact on the system and, and on the budget as a whole. But if you're saying, you know, your budget's not enough in this section because we have too many glitches or too many lost referrals, I could understand that. But go ahead, New Haven. Rock no, I, I appreciate you making my argument, Chair, that yeah. the, there is a, a, a direct expense related to this this issue. I'll, I'll move on. I don't think I don't think we're going to get a figure here, but I, I, I would. Hope that the glitch that caused that issue last year has has been somewhat um, rectified. So, and again, member, if you're saying that you think the budget line is either too low or too high, please please do do that just to relate it back, as opposed to just stating a general uh, general uh, opinion. But yeah, um, shall I carry? No, no. Okay, New Haven Rocky Point. Thank you. Professional services line, uh, I see support for clinical information system was underspent by about 200,000. Oh, sorry, did, did, my apologies, Board and Concord has already asked that. Right, um, anyone have questions? Shall, shall carry? All right, um, if it's the will of the House, I would like to go with the, uh, the, sub -to the totals for each subsection instead of going line by line by line. I, for example, that was a professional <coughs> services question. I was just asked which was a line that was already carried. And that would allow you to ask questions within the subsection and, until the subsection is done. So what I'd like to do, for example, the interoperative electronic health record section, I'd like to read the total interoperative electronic health record line, which is 10,405,100. And then you can ask questions for that subsection as a whole. And then when those questions are done, we'll just carry that, as opposed to going administration, equipment, materials, et cetera. All right. With, is the House okay with that? No, question on that. Yeah. Charlotte and West Royalty. Islanders don't have these books at home who are watching. So wouldn't they like to know how much money is being spent on each line? Uh, Isn't that what we're doing here? Uh, the books are all available online. <laughs> Charlotte and West Royalty. There's many Islanders that don't have access to online information. Minister... I'm not minister. Sorry, I didn't mean to say it. I, I would. I'd very much like the the, the sure. lines to be read out because okay, it's, I can it's do just that. transparent. Yeah. All right. So, um, interoperative electronic health record appropriations provided for the development, implementation, and support for the integrated electronic health record and virtual care administration forty seven thousand nine hundred. Child carry. Equipment thirty two thousand six hundred shall it carry. Well, they don't carry. Printer, printer. Materials, supplies, and services five million six hundred ninety one thousand nine hundred shall it carry. Stop. Carry. Wait. Okay. Okay. You're carrying the lines. Are you just reading them out? I'm you're carrying, carrying each, each line of the lines. Out. This is what you wanted. You want to go line by line, member? So can I ask questions on that? Yeah. Materials, supplies, and services. That's where we're at. So I can't ask questions now on equipment. That's correct. Carry. That's right. We already carried that. Yeah. You could ask again. I suppose. I might allow you at the total for the subsection because the administration is including the total, but that, that was my point as a whole. Why don't we just go to the total and you can ask questions on everything in the subsection. Mm -hmm. um, so can you clarify what section we're on, Mr. We are in interoperative electronic health record and we're on the materials, supplies and services line. Okay. So, um, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Chair, if I may, so there's a bit of confusion here. What I'm not sure where or what you had proposed. So traditionally, we've always gone through these sections. The complete section was read, and then we were able to ask questions on anything pertaining to that section. So what did you propose? I'm proposing that I just read the line for the 
the total for the subsection, and then you can ask questions on anything in the section, as opposed to reading out all the lines and carrying them one by one. And I'm, my only ask about that is, do for Hansard, do does each line have to be um, recorded for Hansard? Is, is, is this a question I have? That last time I was on the floor, I didn't do that, and it was acceptable. You know? But, um, um, I, I mean, I, I can do that if that's the will of the house. I don't have a problem with that. I'm, I'm trying to be as efficient as possible and give you guys a chance to ask the questions you need. So, um, okay, Chair. Yeah, so the yeah, opposition. So I, I, I believe that just to keep everything uh, going as we always did it, um, there should, there's no difference in reading that line or not reading that line other than to have it enhanced. So I think anything that we discuss in this house should be enhanced. So I would prefer to continue on as we always did by reading it, reading the whole section sure. and then open it up to questions on that whole sure, section. I can do that. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right. So here we are. Uh, I've already read administration equipment, material supplies and services, professional services, 207,500, salaries, 4,306,400, dollars travel and training, 55,800, total interoperative electronic health record, 10,405,100. Any questions? Shall I carry? Oh, leader of the third party? Okay. Shall I carry? Total corporate services, 35,196,800. Shall it carry? Page 118, for those following along at home. Financial services, appropriations provided for the administration and operation of financial accounting, auditing, materials management, financial reporting systems, financial planning, and analysis. Administration, 1,176,400. Debt, 256,100. Equipment, 35,700. Material supplies and services, 315,900. Professional services, 637,800. Salaries, 9,468,000. Travel and training, 69,500. Grants, 4,000. Total financial services, 963, or sorry, 11,963,400. And I may as well just read total financial services, 11,963,400. Charlotte Carey. No, Carey. Okay, I've got uh, Charlottetown West Royalty, a leader of the third party in Borden Kinkora. Charlottetown West Royalty. Yeah, um, financial services. Uh, so, for administration, it's just it's up a little bit. What what was that for? And it, and it goes back down, fairly similar to what it was in the in the future. One million one one hundred thousand dollars. So, just a little adjustment there. Can you speak to that? The forecast value had uh, an increase in the, in the value due to delivery and courier costs as it relates to materials management and distribution products. And when we look at the budget for this year, we had um, an, an increase slightly specifically for those items as well, delivery and, cur and courier and insurance. Okay. Right. Uh, Charlotte, how much royalty? Yeah, I'll just keep my hand up. Um, so, our un, under the debt line, can can you just that's the line that we don't often see it. It's because it's a financial section. Um, how do we get? Uh, we we paid more on the debt. A little bit of it's not very much for Health BI. The the debt there. I can describe this yeah. if you wish. It's really an allowance for doubtful accounts. So a higher allowance was forecast considering inflation impacts on the economy. An estimate of the value of accounts receivable that are anticipated to be uncollected, uncollectible rather, is what this is for. And when you look at that for um, health PEI operations, yeah. uh, collection challenges historically are for out-of-country visitors for emergency services and health PEI is not able to refuse patients when um, they come to our hospitals for services. So this is... This is basically an allowance from an accounting standard perspective. Shall I tell West Royalty? No, that's that's really no, that's really good to see. That that number could could balloon based on the 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 collection or the severity of a of something that happens. So I'm glad to see that's that's a small number because that that does happen. Mm -hmm. So um, the next line um, equipment uh, looks like we 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 overspent uh, by almost double on the equipment line um, in finance. I don't, 
Was that computer software? That would be for laptops and phones, and we did have to buy some uh, some furniture. There was a lot of, of new staff. Uh, the transition that we had to have when uh, we weren't able to work from Garfield Street and we had to move um, to the Atlanta Technology Center and Queen Street, we did have to purchase some additional items uh, to take care of staff. Makes sense. And just taking a look at some more of my notes. That's primarily the reason. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Right. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Oh, I'll come back. I see auditing listed under here. Um, I'm just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about uh, what auditing activities are provided here and what the scope of those would be. Sure. And you're looking specifically at the table document? Uh, yeah. Looking under financial services, auditing is listed there. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. So in this section, we have uh, positions that are titled fiscal analyst auditors. So they provide uh, supports to managers uh, directors and executives on a daily basis. You know, they would look at what their spend is, help them with forecasts, help them with identifying what those possible costs, if they had to introduce a new program or service area, even looking at how they roll out new initiatives, et cetera. Part of their role is also looking at all that information as it relates to following the Financial Administration Act, Treasury Board guidelines, and, and that sort of thing. So that would be kind of on a daily basis. Also within that area, uh, we do have a responsibility and we have a role for a uh, physician auditor um, that is, is currently uh, vacant. Um, but they would be responsible to look at um, uh, payments to physicians accordingly. We also have, um, when we look at, at, uh, at this section, we have actuarial and accounting services, but that's not specific to the audit piece. Um, that will be primarily it. I'm probably missing something, but... Yeah, thank you, Chair. And I think you kind of answered my next question. They look at um, value for money in, in services offered by Health PEI? Not in the sense that they would be necessarily documenting that in a report form, but just looking at daily, what does that look like? Okay. Leader of the third party? Thank you, Chair. Um, so, so any of the audits, audits that they do are not public audits? They're kind of just internal? The other third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I am just was looking at the salaries line, and it's up roughly a million dollars. Is that a new position, or is, is what's that? So it's collective agreement and premium increases. We have a plan coordinator for facilities and capital planning, and an annualized value for a position that was introduced last year for the same uh, for facilities and capital planning. We have a strategic sourcing officer, again, it's an annualized value carrying over from last year, and another annualized value, which was two FTEs to support our Medicare office. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, can you tell me what the Gertrude Cotton Trust is? I hope I can remember Sorry, that one. I not trust. I note on that one. <laughs> yes. Okay. There is a board that determines which charitable organizations will receive funding. Now, I'm just going to take a look, and I do, I believe, have a bit of a write-up on that for you. So, if you don't mind me just taking a look here for nope. a minute. Nope. So, the Board of Trustees for the Trust was appointed by Robert L. Cotton. Uh, the agreement was signed April 29, 1963. Uh, the board consists of the Minister of Education, the manager of TD Canada Trust, and a resident of the province who was chosen by the first two directors. Um, monies from the trust are deposited to general revenue. The Department and Health and Trust appropriations are made from a grant account that was established for the distribution of the trust. And uh, the Department of Health PEI serves as a paymaster to various charitable organizations. Uh, the annual disbursements are made to a local charitable and non-government organizations. Consideration will be given to all only distributing the funds 
every few years rather than annually. Historically, organizations that have received support include Canadian Red Cross, Camp Genshif, CNIB, Association of Community Living, at Pat and the Elephant, and Transition House. Good chair. Thank you. And I just want to, I remember when I was Minister of Education, sat on the board, we gave uh, money to beautification as well mm. on the island that people could apply for. Warren Kikor. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Under professional services, and I'm, I guess I'll start with the, the, the Medicare medical consulting mm -hmm. line. There's an increase there. Uh, what was done last year under this under these under this line? Um. There was a forecast there to look at um, strengthening our audit program, where we were um, were looking at hiring a consultant. So that's that's the work that has started, and we're in discussions right now with a vendor on that. Warren Kinkora. Okay. Um, so is there anything further planned for this year, further to that review? Yes, further discussions, and um, hopefully work work with the vendor accordingly. Okay. Warren Kinkora. Uh, I don't have the line right up from the big book here in front of me, but on, on the Medicare cards, I think that line doubled what was budgeted. Was what was t was that? Mm -hmm. Why was that not? forecasted that is in relation to Medicare cards themselves and issuance so it would be uh, an increase in the volume of those Medicare cards but I guess my question would be why why was the volume not what was anticipated was it population growth or? could be due to population and there would be um, it wouldn't be a set value every year so that's another value that we would look at and if that's going to continue to rise, we may have to seek additional funding for that accordingly. So, so do we anticipate, given the steady trends of increasing population, that that is something that would continue to rise to be anticipated and budgeted for? Yeah, that's, that's certainly uh, possible. That's something we'll have to look at. Charlottetown West Royalty. Well, um, so for the capital, you said there was a couple positions for capital planning and source officers. Would that be for the new, specifically for the new mental health hospital? No. 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 So I tell much wealthy. Just what, what would what would uh, what would that would those positions be for? So our strategic sourcing officers work um, in materials management, so they would be the arm of our organization that are responsible to work with. Our leaders, as it relates to procurement. Charlotte Town West Royalty. Um, so procurement, so the, the the purchasing of goods and services um, for operational activities within the hospital. Correct. Could also relate to some capital as well. Yeah. Charlotte Town West Royalty. So the the capital aspect of it, we talked about this, Kelly, before mm -hmm. in public accounts. We have underspent. We underspent. Pretty dramatically on capital projects um, for health, for health, and, and it seems to be a problem. I've, I've asked the former CEO about that. That capital projects, capital places for Prince Edward Island are in dire need, especially as we have to come. Can you just talk about that a little bit? Are these positions scheduled to help that that crisis? Yes. Two of those positions, when you look at facility and capital planning, um, we are very fortunate that we have a significant capital budget. We have significant projects yeah. that are in place, and we need uh, strong project management there to support all of those projects. Yeah. Yeah. Charlottetown West Royalty. And I'm glad to hear that because I was astonished by how much money that we did not spend on important capital projects. And I'm just wondering, is are these are these enough? And are should we have done this a couple of years ago and added these positions? Minister. Well, no, I, actually, I would like to answer that again. It, it's not based on having, I mean, that is a factor, but again, uh, supply chain issues and execution and capacity is certainly uh, a, another factor of that. So it's good to see that we have the pe people in place to support the projects, but there still is execution um, challenges around capital. Gordon Kinkora. Sorry, uh, <laughs> was the question was the last question from Charlton was really on the facilities planning master? No, okay. So that, that was my question was with with respect to the facilities 
planning master program or plan. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like it was overspent by $100,000 last year. Was there an explanation for that? Sorry, it just took me a few minutes to find the oh, line. Sure. My, my trend is small. Um, we had a bit of a delay last year, so it's not an overspend, and that is in relation to the QEH master or program master plan. Uh, so a significant portion of the work was completed in our 23-24 fiscal year, and we had thought that more of it was going to be completed in the previous fiscal year. So it's a timing difference. Gordon can call it. And for the coming year, is that a project that continues or is there something else planned for the coming year? A little bit of both. We're finalizing the QEH master plan in the coming year. And these funds will be a portion of the funds that will support the Prince County Hospital and West master program master plan that will uh, be going to RFP soon. Because my last question would be, just generally, it seems like an odd place for that to be in the financial services section. Has it always been in the financial services section, and is that the right place for that line? The lead of that work is our director of facility and capital planning. So that's a rationale of having the consulting dollars there to support that because that individual leads that work. But as we talked, I believe, yesterday, there is some funding as well in corporate services and a general consulting account. So it's supported across in those two areas. Those are our two funding elements. Thank you. Charlotte Town West Royalty. In that plan, the facility planning, is there any discussion about putting in a, another OR for Prince Edward Island at the QEH? A master program master plan will look at those needs. Uh, over a number of years in the future, between 10 and 20 years in the future. Charlotte, how much royalty? Will that document look at, there was, there was money in the capital budget, um, and it's, I, I just want to know that the plans are ready for the um, retrofit for medical student learners in Prince Edward Island. That was, I think it was 17 million It's going to go into the QEH. We just said 10 to 20 years. Is that in the scope of this too? So I don't have those details in front of me, but that master program, master plan would look at all of the needs. For example, if I, th if I think of the QEH from today, uh, 10 to 20 years out, which they would consider all the data that we have, the population growth and the growth that is, that is expected, and the activities that will be um, happening on Prince Edward Island. So uh, the example you've gave would be the uh, residency, if you will. So yes, that would support it in that. And it would also have to look at how many patient beds would you need, what other services are needed at that hospital, et cetera. Sure. Charlotte Town West Royalty. And with the, with the change to the, um, uh, to the, hosp the Hillsborough Hospital, would that include that too? Obviously, there's changes going to be making, taking place. Um, we're, we're moving to a new facility. Would that encompass, would that plan encompass that facility too? That would be separate. That master program, master plan would have been conducted um, when you look at the mental health campus. Sal Carey? Carey. Carey. All right. Well, I'm, I wanted to ask the, uh, the minister and the stranger, Kelly, if you guys wanted to take a break at all. You've been on the floor for quite a while. We can take a couple minutes. I'm fine. I'm good. You're good? All right. It's tough. It's tough. Medical affairs. General administration, appropriations provided for the administration of the Health Services Payment Act and for the development of partnerships between physicians and other collaborating uh, professionals. This section is responsible for grants and physician supports for the master agreement, the medical residency program, and other physician medical training programs. Administration, 71,200. Equipment, 10,100. Material supplies and services, 147,600. Professional services, 13,150,600. Salary, 7,856,100. Travel and training, 104,600. Grants, 5,942,900. Total general administration, 27,283,100. Charlotte Town West Royalty. Um, the master agreements uh, for, for physicians is being talked about right now. Are we, are we, I know we don't want to hear anything specifics on it, but are, are, is the minister optimistic that that, that will be uh, um, completed or 
in the next year or so? Or what, what are our timelines? I guess, I, I, yeah, we don't like to speak about it, no, but I, I guess one thing I should note is that um, this negotiation, we, they call it IBN, interspace negotiations. Mm -hmm. um, most of them are financial first. So I think uh, the IBM, IBN uh, method is proven to be quite effective. Um, so it's a great opportunity for us to, to align payments with services. So yeah, it's, um, we're very hopeful on the impact that'll have to our physician community. Uh, Charlotte, how much? Oh, I should keep my hand up for you, Chair. Um, professional services. So we, we see that that line is we're down about. Oh, we underspent on it nine hundred thousand. Um, let's just start there. Why did we budget? For something we underspent on by 900,000 under this section, so important. So, that is in relation to supports for physicians um, working in private clinics. And with some of our vacancies, some of those dollars were underspent. So, Go those on supports one. would be for nursing and other type of supports. Second. Show how much early. So, we underspent. On that line, and that's what I continue to hear is that doctors need that support, which I know Health PI does. So it becomes it because we didn't have the stat, we didn't have the nursing staff to support them. How many how many nurses are we talking about here? Would have been. Now, this would be a purchase service whereby if a physician is operating in a private clinic. So that cl private clinic would provide some of those nursing and supply supports. And in some cases where we had physician vacancies, some of those supports were not required to be purchased. Gotcha. Okay. Sure, so that's a, that's a different, so I understand that about the, there's no physician there, there's no nurse needed, there's, and that's what we'd see. Yeah. But when, when there was a physician there, and there's no nurse, I'm trying to get that discrepancy between mm -hmm. those two, mm -hmm. um, is that, a big problem. How much did we underspend on physicians that were trying in private clinics that were trying to get nurses and support staff that couldn't? That's a tough question. Mm, I just want to take a look at an annualized investment sure, before yeah. I answer that question. Some of that funding uh, last year, I was just looking for my write-up, my apologies, yeah, no was problem. to increase the numbers of supports that would be there. I don't have that description in front of me. So that will be part of that funding, recognizing that more supports are required. Okay. Sure, sure. So it was an increase to the complement number. Yes. And we yes. had trouble filling the positions. Yeah. Yes, but the majority of that, that surplus that I speak of was in relation to if the physician itself is vacant, not having to, not requiring to purchase those supports. Sure, gotcha. But, but certainly right. it would be when that position Excellent. is filled. Excellent description, Absolutely. Kelly. Perfect. Okay, so under professional services, so we see uh, a million dollar increase from last year. We underspent last year by a million, and we see, an, so that's a two million dollar shift, but we couldn't even spend the money last year is what is that shift up by a million dollars for um, on that line okay so that represents the medical resident salary funding and, and preceptor increases as well as the funding to support um, the family medicine resident positions from five to seven seats sure how much are so the Five to seven seats, those seats are at Dalhousie. Are, are there seven seats we're funding currently? It, it's, it's five, so but two a year because it's a two-year program. And then when you increase it by the two, it would be two a year for the two-year program. 
those guys. Show how much you're here. So how many, how many are in the Dell program currently from PEI that we're supporting right now? Five or seven? Uh, what's the date? It's effective. Uh, this, this maybe the last year or this year. This is July first, twenty twenty four. So that increase will be for next year. So we're, we're sitting at five right now. We're increasing it by two next year. But then the relationship is going to be over with Dow in 2029 as per correspondence that I kind of tabled in here, Minister. H how many years are we going to have those extra seats for? Uh, how do I answer this? I'll, 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 we didn't attend the Spendall briefing, which was a no, nobody from your party uh, attended it, so I think you would have got a lot of information there. Um, what Dr. Preston Smith has said, administratively running two different residency programs is problematic, so there will be uh, some coordination of effort between the, at the Atlantic dean, Dean's table to ensure a smooth transition. Shall I have Shirley, one more? Smooth transition. So what happens if we're increasing our seats to Dow starting in September 2024, and it's a seven-year program, but we're losing those in 2029. How many, are you, are you aware of that? Is that? Does that adjustment stop in 2029? Do we get zero seats at Dow? So we're increasing from five to seven now, and then 2029 it goes to zero. Um, but it's, it's an Atlantic problem, but it seems like it's a, a problem right here. Budget? I don't know how it relates to the budget. Okay, I'll relate it back. How much how much do those seats cost us, Minister? It's two extra seats. Kelly can do that. It's in, in the note. So as noted, um, that value specifically was five thirty four four hundred. And again, with those it's it's that that relates to um, Paying the salary of those sure, residents, absolutely. right? Good investment. Okay. Yeah. Great. Coming back on the list. Sure. Uh, Board and Kikor. Thank you, Chair. Uh, on the materials side, just pick, pick one out there. I guess I'll, I'll start with that. There was quite an overspend. Uh, where, where did that ex extra unbudgeted money go, and do we need to go? somewhere closer to that going forward for, for whatever reason that money was spent on? This would be a utilization. What that primarily represents is drugs. It, it's Botox uh, for neurology, urology, and physical medicine. It's Botox injections provided by physicians in an acute care setting and is charged back to medical affairs. So there could be a difference in the utilization from year to year. Gordon Gigora. So there was a significant increase in Botox <laughs> last year. Yeah. Would that be for a medical application? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it's neurology and urology and okay. physical medicine. It's not cosmetic. Okay. <laughs> Many uses. <laughs> Foreign uh, concord. Okay. Uh, a little bit of an increase on the salary line. Um, not tremendous, but is there something contemplated by new positions? And if I missed that, I'm sorry. Uh, part of it would be collective agreement premium and benefit increases. And um, we have some annualized investments carried over from last year, uh, which was a contract administrator and a manager of strategic initiative, administrative assistance uh, for physician leaders. Uh, medical education, uh, a medical education undergraduate position and a project management lead and a medical education uh, manager and admin support for the residency program. So those are all annualized. So there was a part year start. Okay. Board and Concora? Um, I'm, I'm looking now at the, uh, where did it go? The 
the physician retention program. Uh, what does that offer? What does that do? Mm. Five hundred thousand. Sorry, I'm just trying to find it on my line here. Oh, there we go. Yeah, th those are as per the master agreement, so those would be payable, and that forecast value oh, would be due to a, a very slight increase in that forecast. So those are grants uh, as determined by the physician agreement. They're negotiated. Board and Concord. I guess I was wondering what, what it offers specifically that program okay. to, to the to the physicians. Uh, is is it is is it working? Um, uh, see if I have a note on that. I may not have a note on that one, uh, but I can certainly it is within uh, the physician agreement that is online. Okay. Board and Concord? Mm. Oh. So the only note I have on it, my apologies, is this program became effective October 1, 2012 to support the stabilization of physician services throughout the provincial health care system. But it is, it is a grant to the Medical Society. Does, does the terms of that get looked at in <clears throat> context? It's 12 years old originally. Does the terms of that get looked at in, in the context of what we're seeing with attrition and, and, and retention challenges? It would have to be considered within that bargaining process. Okay. Okay. Board and and then. Similarly, I'm curious about the grant for a healthy physician workforce. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Is that something set up similarly? Yes. Good. Good. Uh, one more, Boring Concord. <coughs> so, so your 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 same answers would apply. Yes. For reference and. Yes. For, okay. Thank you. Good. Uh, leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I, I missed the first part of Charlottetown West Royalty's questioning, so if, if this question's been answered, just let me know. But I'm wondering how many seats we fund at Memorial University. Sixteen students enrolled in the program. Four per year. Uh, just you want to clarify that, Minister? Just Four per year. Sorry, to, for a total of sixteen. Thank you, uh, Leader of the Party. Thank you, Chair. And so, do we? I know we have seats at Dow, but do we fund those? Does the province fund those? It, it's payment of those um, residents in those seats. So uh, the memorial is different because it's a grant. So it's a, a very specific value for those seats as described, whereas when you look at Dow, it, it's payment of those salaries, if you will. So it's just slightly different. That's why there's a difference in the value on an annual basis. Okay. Leader of the third priority. Thank you, Chair. And uh, so we had an underspend on the visiting specialist uh, travel and lodging. Did we have less visiting um, specialists or just less costs? A fewer costs and it would be based on utilization. Leave the third party. Thank you, Chair. And uh, there were almost no funds spent on the grants, the uh, the specialty training opportunities. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, was it was there was there why that was, or if you have any? I, I can make a comment that when we look at the in-province physicians, um, there is a, an education allotment available 
uh, for 5,000 for a family practice and 7,000 for specialists. So those are primarily utilized. This would be something in addition to that if, so, if someone chose to um, investigate that. So I guess I'll, I'll phrase it by, by summarizing. There are significant dollars available for training for, for the physicians. So um, in another, in another Allotment, if you will. Okay. Well, you're the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, I'm, does Health PEI track um, vacation time and overtime for physicians? Does Health PEI track the overtime? Yeah, vacation time. Vacation, absolutely. It's recorded. They are have to, required to submit um, forms to um, record that vacation, and it's recorded as as a uh, vacation time rather than regular work hours. Yeah. Okay. Leave the third Thank you, Chair. And you're not sure with the overtime, or you don't? Um, I, I believe it is. Uh, all, any value that, I if it is payable, is absolutely recorded in our labor distribution report. Thank you, Chair. And I'm wondering about the medical student rotation program. Okay. Can you tell us what that is? So if I look at that value, it represents um, fees for student rotation. There were over 100, and some of those fees could be for the College of Physicians and Surgeons. Uh, course reimbursement, um, et cetera. Okay. Yeah, there's there one more? Yep, thank you, Chair. And so we had a bit of an overspend on that last year. Mm -hmm. Did we have more students come last year, or what was that cost? A, a little bit more, um, and, but historically there, there's, you know, not a, a huge amount less, but there was additional spend there last year. Okay, thank you. Uh, Cheryl, how much are Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, the, the residency program, <clears throat> we're, we're budgeting um, almost a million dollars more for next year. Is that those DAL seats? Yeah, plus their increase for the salary um, for that. That's correct. Okay. It's to the two combined. Okay. Shell, how much more? But that... To me, I don't know if that makes much sense because I asked you that under professional services, and there's an increase of a million dollars under professional services. This, this would appear. Oh yeah, this is this is the same line. So yes. the second the second section is professional services there. So, yes. um, why didn't we look at residency programs with Memorial? If, if we're spending eight hundred thousand dollars there, there did we did minister? Did we look at those potential to increase our residency seats there in anticipation for what we're we're having as a medical school coming here? Sure, all that. Yeah, I, I remember um, you're trying to compare policies here. Yeah, absolutely. Fair question is why didn't you? Buy more residency seats. I, can you tie it back? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Thank you, thank you, Chair. No problem. Um, no so the medical seat sub memorial have been static at eight hundred thousand dollars for as long as I've been here. Um, there's been the, the ones at Dow were static too until just recently. No, I think you might have missed Kelly's explanation. Uh, no, I, I, I understand. Okay. It's different models, yeah, different yeah, yeah, models okay. between Dow and Memorial. Because yeah, yeah. yeah. I've asked this three times. I have been confused in the past on this line, I must say. <laughs> but this time I'm, I'm starting to understand it. But Memorial, as far when when I realized that, that it seemed like a more of a natural choice to increase that line, why didn't we look at the grant line for Memorial as an opportunity to... Uh, expand further. That's, I guess, that's my question. It's, was that looked at? I guess you know. Again, I'm, uh, I'm, it's not budget relative, but I think every single jurisdiction um, would look at that possibility to, uh, to perhaps uh, 
increase. I know the two uh, from the five to seven progression with Dow took a considerable amount of time, so it's uh, it's great to ask the question, but to execute on it is can be challenging. Oh, I know. Yeah. Sure, I'm and and I appreciate that, and and um, it's it's very difficult. So what I, what I'm wondering too is that there was a dip from, on that in that residency program from um, 23 budget, and it looked like we underspent underspent a little bit on that um, in the third quarter forecast. Are you looking at professional services in general? Yeah, no, just in the the sorry the residency program line. Is that accurate? Is that third quarter? Uh, I have a note here that there's a medical residence salary uh, decrease due to a vacancy. Showdown with royalty. So that happens from time to time. Does that mean that we, we lost one of our island students in that program? It could be, and yeah. I don't know the details of, of that particular one. Showdown with royalty. Um, thank you for that. Um, there is uh, <clears throat> consulting fees on here on the next line that we were we, we over overspent on the consulting fees. What what were those for? Is that for any reports or consulting fees? Yeah, on um, the right after residency programs is a line for consulting fees. Yeah, uh, two hundred thousand, two hundred thirty-two thousand. So when we look at that, that supported uh, work for the bylaws, um, uh, medical reviews that might have to be conducted, um, support for uh, work for medical homes, patient medical homes, uh, support for the physician agreement, uh, planning for medical education. As some examples. One more, Charlotte, how much further? So the the. The support for the medical homes is that more in terms of capital where we're, we're building those or the support for existing are the futuristic medical homes or are they the ones that are operational now on, under that line under consulting? it looks like it's more for the ones in operation now okay yeah. board can go on thank you okay. continuing under the professional fees i'm, I'm looking at the um the consulting the consulting fees line. Um, do we do we remember what what that was for and, and what we're anticipating going forward? I believe I just answered. Oh, sorry. That I, question. I it. <laughs> okay. Okay. And and on the other professional fees, that was the other question I had mm -hmm. was overspent on the other professional fees. Mm -hmm. That was a forecast value, and the forecast notes uh, represent some similar items um, for, for support. Um, and let me see here. And when I looked at the actuals before coming here, there were no actual spent so far this year. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Board, are you good? Uh, shall the section carry? Um, just Charlottetown, I didn't realize. Almost so, missed it. Sorry. I'm uh, sorry, gee, oh, <laughs> That was close, <laughs> Kelly. <laughs> um, <clears throat> what are we consulting for the medical homes? Are, are, is it is it how we get better with the medical homes, or what was that for? I didn't bring further detail with me on that. Um, the value, when I look at the forecast notes, it was approximately ten thousand dollars. So it yeah. wasn't a robust. Nothing too, too big. Um, <clears throat> Charlton, what's your OT? So under, under medical affairs, do we look at, I mean, we have a 10-year plan. We talked about that. We had, but we need space now. Mm. And I know a lot, of, a, a lot of people are working under medical affairs to get space now. Um, where would I find how much money we're spending in that under medical affairs? Um, I already talked about the planning business. So I, I believe your question really relates to capital. Yeah. Charlton West Royalty on the operating budget? Yes, it's on the operating budget. Um, 
I, I, it's hard because I just I, I, I have to know that's that's a major gap for Prince Edward Island. So I wasn't really uh, I didn't really uh, un, under other professionals' fees when you said similar items to that. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. I don't know if that was. I. I, I need more detail on the two hundred thousand dollars that was spent there, um, if I could. As I noted, there was nothing spent this year. That was a forecast value. So it was for similar type of consulting, but there was no dollars spent. Okay. Under that line. Charles <coughs> <coughs> um, Under the um, the medical student rotation program. Medical student rotation. Does, so that means that the the, the the Dow students that we have, in we help support their medical rotation. Is that correct uh, throughout the Maritimes or the? It would be more because that's over a hundred students. Cheryl, can I ask you I don't. I don't understand. I think I can explain that one. So in third year, you apply for clerkship rotations. So it's like, again, um, back to talking to some residents, is that you apply and you don't always get your first choice. Um, and they compete um, to, for placements. So it's, there's some variability in, in that. Great. Gerald, how much are I think I think most of my right. questions have been answered, except for um, local. Uh, locum support programs <clears throat> so we're we're looking at it seems like we are spending a lot how many locums are we predicting to get uh, with that 1.9 million dollars next year I don't have a number of how many that would represent, um, but I can tell you that uh, there has been investments um, to strengthen that program. It was introduced last year as a locum support program, additional dollars to support it. So that represents their supports, not their actual pay. Shield, how much are so, so what supports are, are we talking about? Lodgement, everything, travel fees? Travel, lodging. Mm -hmm. Cheryl, how much are And that's a contract between Health PEI and the doctor specifically. And do we, do we set the terms about how long the, the, how do we set the terms with the locum? Like how long they're here? It's within the physician services agreement. Again, back to there's probably a daily rate or something like that. That we follow, it's not negotiated. It's on a case by case basis. It's, it's very menu driven, so to speak. I know. Cheryl, how much royalty? So, is is when you recruit a locum, is it done individually or through an agency? Is that under the section, Minister? Locum support program. It is. Yeah. Okay, I just double, double checking. I can't follow. I can't find where we're at in the handouts here. Cheryl, how much royalty? Yeah, and I just, I'm just asking that because we, we see a, a difference in uh, with nurses now, physios with other people coming in and representing, and I want to know if this is a, a threat for the the island where we have to move towards an agency to get locums in general. I think it's done on a one-on-one -on -one now, so is that something that um, the minister has heard of or? I can't really comment, but I know there's lots of avenues. The physicians themselves are, are great for uh, recruitment, obviously, and um, so there's many avenues to, to get locums. Mm -hmm. So we spent, we overspent by a little bit last year on that support program, but it was, it was, you said it was just introduced, or was there more? It was just introduced last year, so the. The um, the 1.6 million dollars was the first time that we spent money on this support program. Um, is that going to be evaluated how it, how it went? I think they look at that um, probably daily. If I was to ask them of you know how how is that working as far as recruiting welcome? So yeah. I would say yes. Okay. I'd like to inform the chair. I'm done with this section. And is down. All right. That also means that I'm done with this section. 
Shall the section carry? Yes. In province physician services, appropriations provided for the payment of in province physician services, including family practice, emergency medicines, and specialists. Professional services, one hundred and ten million six hundred sixty thousand. Salaries, fifty one million four hundred ninety five thousand four hundred. Travel and training, six hundred forty six thousand. Total in province physician services, one hundred and sixty two million eight hundred one thousand four hundred. Are there any questions on this section? Board and Kinkora. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, certainly some big, big numbers in, in here. Um, the, the budget here seems to have increased by about 10 million. Um, what in there would be new medical positions? So I will list those for you. I'm going to be talking about it under professional contract services as well as salaries. So uh, hospitalists, uh, Prince County Hospital, emergency Depart department, additional hours. Some of these were annualized and some are new, so I'm going to talk about them both interchangeably. Uh, a dermatologist, an increase in hours per day, uh, the QEH emergency department, uh, backup call, uh, for teleradiology, additional six hours in emergency services for KCMH, uh, a gastroenterologist, a pathologist, additional physician assistants and associate physicians. Um, there's EMR physician remuneration, so as they're introducing that, there's additional pay, so that's a, a line item, so not a specific uh, specialty type of physician, but additional pay. Uh, anesthesiologist, OBS gynae for the QEH, and uh, an allergist, immunologist, general surgeon, medical oncology, uh, PEDS, radiation oncologist, and urologist. Or Cora. S sounds pretty good. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sure I have questions in there, but I'll, I'll think on those uh, after. Um, For the weekend. Look, looking last year on, on, on salaries last year, it was uh, an underspend by about $8 million. Mm -hmm. uh, Was that due to recruitment challenges for, for just not getting the physicians mm -hmm. that we had budgeted for? That would be correct. And I always recommend when we're in this section that we look at professional contract services and salaries combined because physicians have the ability to change pay modalities from fee-for-service or contract, which is on a professional contract services line, or salaries. So when I look at that as a whole, um, we see that we had some vacancies as it relates to family physicians. Uh, so that would be the combined two internal medicine physicians, um, dermatology, anesthesia, and psychiatry primarily. Okay. Um, so, so does the, the underspend, is that, we had some discussion in the last section on locum positions, does that also include underspend on locums in this section? No. Uh, any underspend of our uh, permanent physicians on PEI, that's where also the locum cost or salary through a contract would be showing up as well. So it would offset a vacancy. Okay. Board and Cora. Um, you mentioned um, the compensation arrangement. Are more physicians coming under a, a fee-for-service arrangement nowadays? Salary. So, so... Or in Concora? Um, do we do we wrote, know roughly the the ratio of? So when we look at salary session on contract, it's a bit. Uh, let me see, seventy four percent, twenty six percent fee for service. Seventy four twenty six. Or in Concora. So. With that you know, movement towards the salary, um, we've increased the budget by eight million. Is 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 that is that enough? Um, do, given the trending, I can answer this. I would love to go to Treasury Board with a special warrant <laughs> uh, if we exceed those expectations. <laughs> 
Not Gordon to be, Gakora. Yeah, not to be contrite, but yes. Okay. That would be great. Be a quick one, I'd say. Yes. <laughs> uh, what about uh, for 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 you know for doing this for for attracting and getting getting these doctors in in the seats? Are there fees associated under this line for HR for 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 consulting fees? No. Just there. Yeah, it, this is just in province physicians. Uh, one more, Warren Kikor. Okay. Um, and, and it seems I don't have the page turned up to me here, but just my notes suggest that we've we've overspent on the fee for service physicians, but we're not budgeting more for that line. So, I guess my question would be on that. Um, I'm just gonna, I just want to look at my table document for a minute. So the forecast for the table document so shows 104.25 million right. compared to a budget of 105.6. Right. So Boring Concora. So we've under underspent on that. Are we prepared for the I guess what changes have occurred that make you feel we can can, can we hire more physicians? <laughs> I'll answer it in this way. Some of the physicians that I noted earlier on for the investments, um, their natural preference is fee for service. Okay. Okay. Cheryl, how much are they? Thanks, and thanks for bringing this back. That's important. These next two lines are incredible. Um, you mentioned to the Prince County Hospital, you added on to the emergency department. Uh, could you speak about that? I, I was just I was writing down really quickly. Uh, so when we look at um, how physicians are currently paid, it's a sessional rate and it's based on hours. So that represents uh, additional hours. So that, that would essentially mean an additional overlap of more physicians within a 24-hour period. So okay. it's kind of a daily rate for the hours. Okay. How many are we short there currently in the Prince County Hospital? Like if we just mentioned it. Can I, can I even ask that right now? Do you want it's tough. I mean, again, it's tough to answer that it's a question as it relates to, to the budget. Yeah. But again, yeah, we continue to recruit there. Sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure, I'll tell you what um, Hours per day at QEH, you, you'd mentioned that too. Um, that's obviously going way up. Um, can you give me a comparative from last year to this year? Is that possible? Like, how does uh, that so last year it was introduced additional nine hours. So that investment that I spoke of is um, in reference to that. So. Seventy-one hours per day. Sure, I'll have a show. Okay. I guess is uh, is that. Is that comfortable for the? Is that is that a comfortable number for you, Minister, to have that? Well, I guess you said we went from 62 to 71, and we are increasing capacity and putting the budget behind it. Sheldon, what's your You listed a lot of good doctors. Congratulations for getting the ones that you did. Uh, I mean, it's 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 very difficult. I understand that. Um, where are our threats? Where are the threats that we need to be? paying attention to in Prince Edward Island. Um, we did get some doctors in. Um, where are the areas like, I mean, what do we have to watch out for, Minister? Like, I, I'd, I'd look at vascular surgery. We, we have to send people off island for vascular surgery. We did have that service once upon a time. What are we, what do we have to be ready for? Where are we recruiting as hardest this time? Well, I mean, the overreaching answer is, is the PG report will guide where we go. I mean, again, base services like anesthesiology and internal medicine obviously are critical across the country. Uh, so, you know, again, the PG report really identifies 
you know, those kind of numbers that we need to, to follow to try to fill. Cheryl, do I wish royalty? So with professional services going up, how do we come to that number um, that, that we had $110 million uh, budget? How do, how do we come to that number? Is that based on um, the, the complement that we're able to recruit for, the total complement? So in looking at that budget, it will be a review of that complement, which is aligned with the Peachy report, but also looking at what do we think is feasible that we could implement in the next fiscal year accordingly. Okay. All of those things are considered. Okay. So when we're looking at salaries, I know we talked about this, so when it goes down, you're not surprised that, that we underspent on that by almost $8 million just because we couldn't get we couldn't get the doctors. Is that correct? So then that becomes a that becomes a $13 million difference in salaries between where we spent and where we're, we're going uh, in the future. That's very difficult to close that gap. Would you agree, Minister? That's a tough, tough line to, to close. Members, um, sometimes I know it's hard to keep track of everything that's going on. So I, I know the minister just had this exact conversation uh, uh, with, the, with, with the member about uh, uh, not filling positions and then being guided by the, the report to show where they're trying to go in the next fiscal year. So um, it's all good information, but if we can just try and ask either new information or if it's clarifying off of, of another question that was previously asked, just so we can keep on track here. Sheldon, what's your Federal government, um, the federal government uh, came in with a lot of money to help stabilize the health care system. And it was d done in specific different directions and in different areas. Um, does any of can you use any of that money to recruit doctors, and can you use any of that money to in in this in the next two lines, uh, the most recent money? I think it was like ninety some million. Is that usable money for for these for these two sections in province phys physician services and out of province health services? Again, back to a bilateral agreement. There's four. Um, specific areas that it's focused on and forgive me for the memory bank is a little short at this time of the day but it, it, it's focused on four particular areas data and health, health informatics uh, aging with dignity oh, gosh and I can't remember the two so again I think back to my original comment which the chair said you know we allocate physician salaries and and it's a, if we have to uh, if we exceed those targets we will certainly request uh, we're not I can't see a stopping, but we need in the budgetary process need to assign a number based on history and what we think we can we can action on. Thank you very much. Thanks. Shall the section carry? Carry. Out of province health services appropriation provided for the administration and payment of out of province health services under the Hospitals Act and the Health Services Payment Act. Professional services, 53,650,500. Grants, nil. Total out of province health services, 53,650,500. Shall I carry? Uh, Cheryl Dan Westerwaldi. Yeah, so this is, um, so professional services, and I asked a question about this in the legislature. I, I just can't wrap my head around how we spent, we spent, are we budgeted for $53 million? We spent 61 in out of province, and we're, we're, we're looking at professional service of going back to $53 million. That's a static line, in my opinion. Um, when the services, we just went through the in province uh, doctor line where we're struggling to get doctors, wouldn't that? I'm just going to ask that why is that number static? So when we look at out of province health services, uh, the dollars in this section relate to uh, payments for services for uh, physician services, inpatient values, and outpatient values. So uh, you heard me speak yesterday about health PEI on a daily basis, quarterly basis, annual basis. We're always looking at what does our spend look like and identifying early last fall 
we knew that we would be underspent in areas that we've already talked about. So we had significant conversations with the Department of Health and Wellness, Department of Finance, uh, whereby we identified some possible um, one-time spending. So in this section, we do have some of those. Uh, one that I will note is under the grants, and it is a one-time funding initiative to support uh, the expansion of the IWK Emerge for $2 million. In addition to that, um, we do have two other um, one-time spends of the amount of $7 million. They support uh, a mandate to negotiate a service level agreement uh, with Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, working with them to improve capacity. So when we look at out of province health services, rates are set for the inpatient and outpatient values on an annual basis, and I can go through those details. Um, so if you remove those one time values that I just described, it does bring it in line with, with the budget. If I reflect on last year's actual spend in the previous year, we were, we were underspent accordingly. Chair Thomas Rosie. So... I, I, I get it. I get it now. I, I guess, you know, $7 million service agreement to improve capacity. What I, what I understand from talking with the, the former CEO when he was here is that are we talking about the service agreements with, with two other provinces to get services that we don't have, like vascular, like um, the emergency, cardiac? Um, is, that what, is that what you're talking about? So when I look at, uh, at this, um, there's been an overarching reciprocal billing agreement since the late 80s, and that's what it's referred to, whereby it's almost like a portability agreement. Mm -hmm. So every year, I'll describe it in depth, um, each province is required to submit to Chi High their financial data as well as statistical data in September of each year. Chi High then analyzes that information and reports it back to what they call a rate review working group, which I sat on for years. Every province has um, an individual that is, that is there. CAIHI provides that information, and when they analyze that data, they come back with, with what you call an inpatient per diem value or a hospital rate for those individual hospitals all across Canada. They also provide what we call a standard national outpatient rate. And then the physician agreement is based on the physician agreement in that province is how we pay that. So there's always been an overarching agreement, and it's called a reciprocal billing agreement. When I speak of capacity, it means if there would be additional services or greater services, we have to work with uh, our neighboring provinces so that they can plan and understand what our needs are. So those service level agreements represent that. When you look at reciprocal billing, because it goes it looks backwards, some of those uh, mm -hmm. investments that might be required would not be included in those approved rates that I described. So this would be in relation to partnering with them and identifying any capacity needs. So that might be, as I described with the IWK for uh, supporting their eMERGE expansion. Perhaps they would need additional physicians. Perhaps they would need an expansion to well know where. Perhaps they would need other infrastructure. So it's uh, having those broad discussions. Cheryl, how much royalty? And I just want to compliment Kelly That's for going through that after two hours on the on the floor to come up with that information. Don't ask that me that was, question at QP. Wow, well, you're going to get a reciprocal rate. Uh, Shall the section carry? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I've got about 10 constituent calls that I'm going to just say, I'm just going to repeat that uh, because they have, they have questions. And obviously this is important for Islanders because we don't understand. And even in standing committees, we're hearing that, that there's, our neighboring provinces are under threat as well. And it really comes down to, I understand the long-term investments, the $7 million, the $2 million, but we're scared when, when, when we go across to make sure that how does Islanders get the services that we deserve equitably 
but when other provinces are struggling too as well. And that's really the question that our islanders are coming down and the threat is there. And you know, vascular, heart is another one. So I, I understand that was a great explanation of something long-term. I'm glad our province is investing in these long-term resources. But what do I tell my constituents that are, are worried at a time of need when they need the services the most? My, my answer is gonna be a little oversimplification, but again, if you are in a serious condition, and you arrive at the QEH, you get care. If you're in serious condition and you arrive at the PCH, you get care. If you're in a serious condition and you require care in Halifax and St. John, you get care. When we had that intermittent stoppage, my understanding was that there was a little bit of friction between residents from Dow at a facility, and they had some issues, and that's what resulted in the you know, short three or four days. So back to the, my answer is that, again, I would assure any, anybody that that, that that model continues to happen in our system. Yeah, exactly. Cheryl, how much royalty? And, uh, it's a, and I, I, I appreciate the minister's answer, and, mm. and I guess this is just of the utmost important to a lot of people and to hear yep. their calls and to, yep. to, to when they, I had a constituent that went over across the way and the doctor told them, said, you, you have to go back to your province and talk about this. And you have to go back and, because we are, we are slammed in different places. And I'm worried, just like Islanders are, that, that the care and the agreements just, they, they need to be there. And I'm glad Kelly's in the position that she has with her great team, but this is a worry for, for Islanders, and I'm just worried about the, 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 if you take those agreements, is this where we talk about the vascular surgery agreements? Is this where we talk about the difference agreements? Um, and and Health BI talked about it. When are those going to be signed, and how, uh, do they need to be signed at this time? Let's talk. Yeah. Discussions are ongoing. Are they? Um, so you take that, you take those long-term investments out, the QEH, and I, I'm sorry, I don't know where the $7 million one goes to, and those are important ones for us, especially the IWK, and I know they're, they're excluded. Is there any other ones that we're, we're having to invest in in the future? Um, I do believe that one was in, that's in Nova Scotia, and is there anything, we do get care in New Brunswick, is there anything... I mentioned both. Okay, okay, I just couldn't, yeah, perfect. Cheryl, time with Cheryl. Um, so, <coughs> when we're looking at this, when people go, is there any funds in here? What happens to my constituent when they go and get service for cardiac? We don't have it over there, they've got the service. The doctor just charges them back to PEI, but they don't have a family doctor, um, and they can't reach the doctor that provided the the uh, the procedure on them. And they have no, they have just a little discharge plan, and because this happened, this this happened. So where where does out of pro province health services meet in province health services when you don't have a family doctor? With all due respect, back uh, budget. Yeah, to I mean, we're talking. Connect that to the budget member. Yeah. Valuable question. I just. Yeah. 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 Honorable member, like the, obviously this is a significant part of the the budget, and, and we could ask health policy questions forever in, in here, kind of thing too. So just trying to focus them towards the budget as much as possible. I can't answer that. I don't have any other questions right now. Shall the section carry? Uh, sorry. sorry. I thought it was on the list. Before. Yeah. I don't have you, but it wouldn't be the first time I've ever made a mistake. No, so. my, my fault, Mr. No Chair. No problem at all. I was just flagged me down, and I can add anybody to any time. Sure. Uh, Gordon Gora. I oh, guess I'm not sure how, how you would answer this question, uh, but I'll ask it. Um, and, and I think that sort of the, the substance of it was discussed in the previous exchange, but overall, from you know, thirty thousand foot view, do we have? Any idea of the, the, the additional cost associated with these services being provided at a province versus in province? It's a huge question, I get. But uh, are, you, are you looking at, you know, what are comparable per diem rates? 
that your question? I get, and my answer, again, I'm the layman here, is to say that most, many, most of these services since we can't or most likely will never provide them PEI because they are cost prohibitive. We can't have a cardiac unit here and staff it appropriately and pay for it and have the volumes to justify it. That is a soft answer, but... Um, no, I was just trying to get... Yeah. Is, is that... Uh, I don't remember. Yeah, what, I would probably what, like what, mm -hmm. If it's something that we take advantage of off-island, off you're wondering what the cost would be to provide it Could we do it here? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a big question. Minister? Yeah, and I guess my, my original question, my original answer would stand that... Some of these services historically we have never provided, and most likely will not. We can't. We wouldn't be able to track the physician or or have the resources to, to maintain these services or have the volume to justify them. Boring Kikor, has there ever been an, an analysis done of that? That the statement that you've just made, as far as we can't have this, so therefore we don't even open the door for that. But you know, do we have the data to know that maybe cardiologists can't, but maybe maybe uh, some other specialist could. And I'm thinking of some that we've had before, but, th but we've lost. Well, and I guess you would go back to, again, layman is redundancy too, was, you know, in order to have a cardiac unit, we wouldn't need more than one physician in order to operate that service. So again, I think a lot of them would be very, quite easily cost prohibitive to, to, to even consider. Um, but to your original question about what other ones, I guess we always struggle with redundancy and coverage on a particular service, you know, so. Is it fair to say, though, that if, if the service was available closer to home, the health outcome for the patient would be better? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So. If I can interject, too, I remember asking the exact same uh, question in the legislature, but more or less the minister, if, if there's something that looks to be a trend that we're it, it gets to the level of we should be looking at it mm -hmm. on island. The answer back to me at the time was that the department or Health BI will look at providing that service if it gets to the point where it's flagged that yeah we're we're doing so much of it off island it makes sense to provide our own service on island. Is that I'm, is I'm that sure correct? they look at the fifty five million every year as a breakdown of what of what services are being provided in that number. Yeah. Absolutely, and there have been in the past a couple of instances where we did repatriate some of those services. Dialysis services would be one, and neonatology would be another. Sorry for interrupting. I just mm -hmm. remember the same question and getting an answered previously. Uh, Borden Kikor. So, further to that decision making, do we have and are we keeping the data that might be used to lend itself towards making those determinations for? Off island versus potentially on island. Yes. For Hikora. Um, further <sighs> to that, and the data that's being kept is: are there people assigned with regularly reviewing and analyzing and looking at that to make <laughs> maybe year-to-year -year determinations? Because I would sure, I, I would think it would change fairly regularly, annually. Um. Yeah, this, this data is often looked at. It is complex. Um, the reciprocal b billing agreement allows for one year to bill from date of service. So the data, oftentimes, we don't, we don't even have billings just yet for some services that occurred even a year ago. And we do collect data based on uh, information from our Ada Province liaison nurses. So it's data that we're always looking at. But a comment I'll make in addition to that is... Um, the cost prohibitive is one piece, but it's also about the call. So the challenge becomes you can't just have one, you have to have three. Because when you're looking at, you know, one and three call, that's onerous and you're looking at a uh, work-life balance that it can present challenges. So we have to look at that, we have to look at the cost, and then we have to look at keeping up those specialty level of services. Because if you're doing um, one uh, specialty piece of service, I'm not talking very well in clinical terms, my apologies, um, but you know, maybe the professionals in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick can do that 50 times a week. Um, they're keeping up their skills, so all of those are considered as well. Okay. Gordon, Gordon. What, what would be the most common out of province? So I can look at, I'll provide that by review of our physician costs. So a lot of those services would include anesthesia services, internal medicine for cardiology, pediatrics, um, there is some general practice, radiology, and ophthalmology. 
I just kind of, you know, the, those are the top ones. Four and four. And other things within oh, this, sorry. I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Kelly. <laughs> other things within this area would be high cost procedures, as an example. So if I look at our 22, 23 records, because uh, those would be the most complete, there were 14 bone marrow trans transplants, five liver transplants, 15 pacemaker implantations, and 12 heart transplants, and 23 kidney. So those uh, are services and procedures that would never be done on PEI, so they take up a very significant portion of that cost as well. Board and Concord. Is there any in interest and I'm not I'm not coming down one side or the other, but it's just looking at from a budgetary perspective Has there been any thought in the department to? formalize an arrangement With other provinces in the Maritimes for the delivery of services that we don't anticipate ever being able to to pursue <laughs> Kind of like a like a maritime hub of specialty service ag agreement uh, for, you know, Moncton does this, St. John does that, Halifax does this, and we all are more formally tied together? That is part of that original uh, response I gave, where right now we're looking at those service level agreements just to do that, but we've had those overarching agreements, which are more of a portability agreement, where those rates are set. But respecting and understanding the capacity and so that our provinces can plan together, we're having those conversations. Board meeting for us. Fine. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For now, could I go back on the list? You sure can. Cheryl Town West Road. Yeah, well, we are. Oh. Members, the hour has been called. We will report progress. Good job, Kelly. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> excellent. Stay. I know. Kelly's willing to stay, but. <laughs> I just need a request. <laughs> All right. <sighs> Mr. Chair, I move that the speaker take the chair and that the chair report progress and beg leave to sit again. Shaw Carey. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks. Thank you. Madam Speaker, as Chair of a Committee of the Whole House, having under consideration the grant supplied to His Majesty, I beg leave to report that the Committee has made some progress and begs leave to sit again. I move the report of the Committee be adopted. Chair Carey. The hour has been called. The Honourable Member from Kensington Malpeck. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move secondly by Summerside Rumor that this House adjourn until Tuesday, the 18th or 19th at. Uh, 1 p.m. <laughs> Shall I carry? Thank you, sir. Have a good weekend, everyone.